Good evening, everyone. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states, for the record, that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. I'm going to ask you to please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It's great to have our MLD here with us this evening. I'm going to read a quick public hearing notice and then we can have some discussion. In accordance with Chapter 161, 166, Section 22 of the Massachusetts General Law, a public hearing will be held by the Board of Selectmen at North Reading Town Hall, Room 14, 235 North Street on Monday, June 19, 2017 at 720 p.m on the joint petition of Verizon New England Inc. and Reading Municipal Light Department for a new poll to be located on Nickel Street as described in RMLD's plan number 1949 dated 420 2017 Board of Selectmen. Mr. Chairman, if we might just uh, postpone further consideration of the public hearing until after we uh, do the proclamation. I think we have somebody present for the proclamation which is on the that sounds good. We could certainly do that. You don't mind if we hold off for a few minutes, right? We'll make up the time. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to proclaim Wednesday, July 26, 2017, as spirit of the 27th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and to read the proclamation. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion before Mr. Schultz reads the proclamation? I believe we have a representative here. No? We were expecting a representative for the Independent Living Center, but they're not here this evening. Not a problem. We have public comment at 9 o'clock, so they could probably come up then if they uh, are running a little late, but please read the proclamation. Okay. It's actually uh, for the chair to read? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I, Michael A. Prisco, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen of North Reading, Massachusetts by virtue of the authority vested in me by the people of North Reading as an elected official do hereby proclaim Wednesday, July 26, 2017 as spirit of the 27th anniversary of Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. I urge all citizens of North Reading, Massachusetts, its community leaders, businesses, government officials to celebrate the contributions that people with disabilities have made and continue to make. As Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, of North Reading, we renew our commitment to upholding the non-discrimination principles of ADA. I urge that all citizens support the efforts of the Independent Living Center of the North Shore and Cape Ann, Inc., which is the voice of all persons with disability and their families. This proclamation is an accomplishment of the rights of all persons with disability under ADA in their daily activities, struggling and triumphs here in North Reading. In witness whereof, I have hereby set my hand in the sale of the town of North Reading this 26th day of July. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. We'll get back to the public hearing, but if the individual you're referencing shows up, we can take care of public comment. Mr. Gilberto, how did you want to handle the start of this? Did you want to say a few things? Uh, so just, uh, I would ask maybe just a brief description of the reason for the poll uh, location. Yes, uh, if you do you have the schedule. Uh, we do, yes, and the board has okay. it as well. Yes. Sketch shows that show that uh, the house number nine uh, off of Nichols Street is fed actually from a long driveway that is between uh, house number seven and number nine. And apparently the poles uh, are located on the other properties, I mean, number seven's uh, uh, basic, basically property. 
So we try to set a new pole, and uh, uh, from that pole on Nichols Street, which is pole 91, uh, three dash one, and from there, uh, in order to feed house number nine, they're gonna go underground on their own property. So this is the way really to correct the situation and get those poles off of the numbers, house number seven's property. That's a reason for it. Are there any concerns that anyone's aware of? Have you had any issues brought to your I attention? I don't believe we've had any inquiries in the office, no. Then no. there's nobody here from the above, okay? Do you have anything else on this? That we Nothing else. That's, this is the right way to do that, basically, so it's the only impact. Okay, and we need a motion, right, to uh, approve this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to grant the joint petition of Reading Municipal Light Department and Verizon New England, Inc. to locate one new pole on Nickel Street as shown on plan number 1949, dated April 20, 2017. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. I have a second by Mr. Minipelli. Any more discussion? It's yes. Just a quick, just a quick point of clarification. Yes. How many poles will be on Nickel Street now with the addition of this one? On that, I don't have the exact number of poles, but uh, we got poles. Uh, that's the main line, basically. I don't have the exact number of poles. Uh, that's uh, over here now. Uh, uh, the one that they have on this page. It's on Nickel's pole number one, two, three. Uh, there are five four. poles. Five poles. Right. And this one is going to be across the street from uh, pole number three. I see pole number three. I only see three. And then you add this one. I only yeah, see Yeah, this four. is pole one, two, three. Pole number four is right by house number 12. Yeah. And pole number five is right in front of the house number 16. So okay. this pole is three ah, dash one, is. Okay. which is going to go across from pole number three the opposite side of the street. And from there, house number nine is going to go underground to get the service. And those poles from the driveway of uh, house number seven, they're going to be removed. Okay. You good? Good. good. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. Any more discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's close the public hearing first and then we I think we have to close the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a move, uh, motion to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now on the motion. Read the motion again? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I move to grant the joint petition of Reading Municipal Light Department and Verizon New England, Inc. to locate one new pole on Nickel Street, as shown on Plan 1949, dated April 20, 2017. Second. Second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Now, the floor is all yours. Okay, well, thank you for having us. Um, I have with me uh, Jane Parento, our Integrated Resources Director, and Hamid Jafari, our Director of Engineering and Operations. And together, we're going to do the presentation. Um, this is a presentation that we did uh, essentially last year um, for all the towns. And um, so there's some information for FY16. We haven't really finished FY17. So we'll give you some updates that are more current. But essentially, it's the presentation that was done at the um, annual town meeting um, in the town of Reading. So um, this is wonderful free artwork uh, for our second year in a row of, of being paperless. Uh, all of our annual reports were done again um, without using any paper. This year with our Shred the Peak, and Jane's going to speak to it a little bit more, uh, this is so that we can integrate it into the schools and our t-shirt contest got changed into an art contest. This was the first year. It was a great success. We had a lot of really wonderful artwork from North Reading. Uh, and so the Shred the Peak and eliminating, um, you know, unnecessary usage of electricity during peak pricing 
is what we're trying to get the kids to, to understand. You know, similar to integrating recycling. I mean, you know, recycling went into the school system, and at the end of the day, I'm walking around with a plastic bottle that I won't put down until it goes into recycling. So it's a great way of helping, um, you know, the kids to, to understand that if they want to keep the pricing down for electricity across the board for all of our customers, this is a great way of doing it. And we tried to, you know, we, get, we had some artwork that basically brings a new hip way of demonstrating, you know, cut that peak off, you know, between, you know, two and seven time periods. So uh, we're hoping that next year the, the art contest will pick one of those uh, drawing specifically for our annual report. Is that someone's drawing? Is that one of the students' drawing? Uh, well, got, actually, my daughter did that. My, so my daughter did that one. Um, I was going to say to they try got to the point totally. Yeah, to that try one. to kick it off. Well, but then we brought it in, and they, you know, Jane's group put the, uh, you know, the axes on it, and. Um, and they did a good job. You know, we're, we're, we are trying to keep costs down. I mean, there was at one point not too long ago where, you know, the artwork for an annual report, it was very corporate and business looking, and the artwork was very expensive. And um, so this was more of just a free kickoff, and then we're going to hopefully uh, reward the children of, of the system schools to, um, to, you know, to win that, you know, and, and we'll be donating money towards, you know, the art program and, and to the kids themselves. So. Okay, so this is your FY16 statistics. It basically just gives the parameters of uh, RMLD. Just a couple of updates on that. The FY17 uh, peak was 163 megawatts on August 12th at 4 p.m. And our latest peak this year is 154 megawatts on Tuesday, June 13th at 6 p.m. Okay, yeah, sure. Is it all possible? in the future update this slide to show you have pole installations to show double pole installations? We, we actually it's have a, um, a slide on that. So I know you do. Oh, okay. Can we show them the statistics so we can see on one year or another where they go down? Um, the, only, the only problem with that is it changes daily. It's, it it's once a year, right? I mean, you keep track. It's a metric you don't keep track of? Uh, we keep it daily. We, we have a, what's called an engine system, which is ball and court. Mm -hmm. So depending on whose custodial area, whether it's a Verizon set or, or a Reading light set, the pole goes in, and then all the attachers are notified. Mm -hmm. So first electric does a transfer, then Comcast, and then it goes all the way down. And once everyone's transferred, the custodial person, whether it's Reading light or Verizon, takes the pole butt out. Um, but that's happening, you know, it's, it's every day is, um, it could All change. All I'm asking for is yeah. just, you know, just stop at the beginning of 2017 with double poles, a number okay. of them. And when you get to the start of 2018, how many do you have? Okay. You know, it should, we, we want to see the trend going down. You can okay. attribute it to poor driving, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will certainly uh, provide that for North Reading, but you know, let you, me. You made some selection of statistics up here. Okay. You, know, and you did it for a reason. And all I'm saying is, right. I know from I'm only speaking for myself here. This has been a statistic that has been a little bit of a okay. An issue. I, I will put in a slide on the next page for North Reading and and show the trend. My concern is with all of the maintenance that we are doing and all of the circuits that we're upgrading. It might not be a trend that it's going down. We may add an extra 25 poles, but we just improve the reliability of three neighborhoods. So it. I'm just a little bit concerned that it's, you know, so you may have all of these older poles and we've gotten rid of all of them, so we've gotten rid of 30 poles, but we've added 50. Yeah, but the numbers tell the story. That's why I want to see the metric, because you should tell the story. You should come to us and tell us the story, because okay. we're the ones that get the phone calls. Yes. And it's, I can't explain it. So okay. When we get to, get to that slide, I'll have Hamid do a okay. little um, discussion That's of fine. what happened with the poles in North Reading. Like but I understand in, in certain Sorry, Mr. Siri. So, you know, the way I look at it is when we see a double pole, that means red, uh, Reading Light has already dealt with the pole, correct? Yes. They've gone, they've put in a new pole, yes. and we're waiting for Verizon, Comcast, exactly. or whoever else. Yeah. And I think I, from a, 
know, I've been on the board quite a while. My frustration is I go down the streets I typically drive on, and the poles are still there. The double poles are still there, and they're not or getting or done. Piece, or pieces. Or pieces. Yeah, that's what I mean by that. Yeah. And it seems to me, and we've gone through this before, it's, you know, Verizon, Comcast, we're waiting for them to do it. And I don't know where the leverage comes from. Does Reading Light apply leverage to get this done? Well, it depends on who's holding up. I mean, I have worked for utilities that, you know, the selectmen would have Comcast come in after we've pressured them as a utility to have them transfer. Um, you know, there's, diff there's different ways of, of doing it. Um, when we get to the double pole one, I think we can probably go over the areas where they're at, and Hamid can shed a little light Let's on that. Well, we, we've got contract negotiations coming up with uh, Verizon and Comcast. Yeah. Well, I think this is their poles that they're, it's under their control, so it's their arrangement with these utility companies, what they can put on there. No, no, that's not the issue. Is they come and they replace the pole. They you know, do. Yeah, ready? Yeah. Like, puts the, moves their wires, gets the pole in place, and as you drive by, either it's a double pole or it's a piece right. of a pole hanging in there. And the reason why it's hanging there is because right. Verizon, Comcast haven't come and moved it. Right. They, they have to move right. it over before the electric company can come in and take the pole down. The rest of yeah, the, the, right. the what we're suggesting pole. is that right. we use some leverage in our negotiations to try to get them to expedite the transferring off the old poles onto the new one as part of some kind of a negotiation. Yeah. And getting back to what you said, Michael, because these contract <laughs> negotiations, any information we can get from Reading Light associated with list and location of all of these would be very helpful. I'd, maybe I'd, I'd like to suggest we let Mrs. O'Brien go to that slide, and then we can continue the discussion on that slide. Thank you. Yeah, because I'm looking at it, Comcast only has one, so your biggest culprit looks like us. <laughs> Comcast only has one? Yeah. That's I find it very hard to believe. Maybe they're all then Verizon. Verizon. Then they're all Verizon. Yeah. No, it's RMLD, which is what I kind of knew yes. going into this. Um, but if we could go to the next slide, unless you, do you have anything else on this nope. one? Nope. So I'm just going to run quickly through some highlights that were have been accomplished over the last year. Um, a reminder that uh, we created a new service requirements handbook, which is an A to Z handbook for all of the residents, electricians, con contractors, whatever. It's online. Integral to that is the updated terms and conditions. Um, Last year's audit was clean with no management letter. Uh, we developed a new solar choice program, Community Solar, which Jane will speak to in a minute. Um, the short and long-term organizational uh, study recommendations and the reliability studies that we did a year and a half ago, where those are ongoing, we're implementing them, including rewriting all job descriptions, redoing wage rates, career development plans, et cetera. Uh, grid modernization technology roadmap has been created. Um, GIS overhaul, we finished collecting all of the GIS data, so we're, we're putting that together right now, and then we're going to start the integrated system. We installed the AMI RF mesh network for the 500 Club. That's our large customers, um, so that we have smart meters in there. The peak reduction program, um, and the technology and incorporation into the school programs. As I said, the art contest it comes along with um, an educational piece and then maintaining our reliability indices, which Hamid will speak to. Uh, we have a slide on the LED streetlight uh, project, which Hamid will go over. Um, internal and external communications program, uh, we have our, our Twitter followers have tripled. Um, it's really where everyone should look if you want a, an outage update. Um, we, we're trying to get away from people um, calling in to get updates so that they can look at Twitter so that the control room can, you know, focus on, on getting the, the power back on. We are also going through some of the schools and things like that for power alerts or anything like that that comes through on the grid system if we were to have a power warning or anything like that. Uh, paperless objective, uh, we talked a little bit about that. 
but some other things that are happening inside that are going paperless billing. Uh, we incorporated a SharePoint program. The board and cab packets are now all uh, paperless. The capital expense budgets have been uh, uh, revised to do six-year projections, and that seems to be going really well, including a budget to actual, which we didn't have in the past. Uh, some major maintenance um, was the replacement of 27 breakers and all the relay systems at substation four. Uh, we re-insulated the bus at substation five, which is a major project. We're on our capital project, we are going. We are looking at land right now in order to build a new substation in Wilmington. Um, those negotiations for the land are still underway, uh, but we have maintained substation five. I think you know for at least five years to get us to that point, so we can have uh, some strong reliability. Uh, all of the reliability <coughs> safety upgrades that were recommended by Booth and Associates have been completed. And I want to mention that there's a safety video on service ownership, meaning that it's on YouTube and it says this is what RMLD owns, this is what the homeowner owns, this is what we do for maintenance, this is what you should do for maintenance. And it, it talks about that care and that maintenance from both an electrician and an in-house technician so that people are clear. And it talks about things of proper grounding so that you can protect your electric service. And you know, a lot of times people will do an annual HVAC maintenance, but they don't look at their electric service, and that should probably be inspected every five years. But take a look at that video. The guys did a really good job, and um, I think you'll find it helpful. Question on your um, sure. external and internal communication. Yes. I know last time we were here, I brought up the idea about the app, creating an app. Yes. Are you guys still And we did. It? Oh, you did do it. Oh, we did it right away. I will download it. I've been yes. waiting to get the news that it was out. Oh, I'm That's sorry. Fantastic. I thought we sent you an email. I apologize. That's a big one. It's, a it's fantastic. Having an app would be great. Michael? I want to do it when we speak. Yes. One thing along the same lines, too, notifications. I'm sure you don't want a million phone calls saying my power's out. Is there a Facebook presence with RMLD right now? Not yet. Because I really would recommend the North Reading Community Connection. You can, And that gets a lot of traffic in North Reading, and you would be able to communicate. Right. They all go to their cell phones. So powers out people can still access it that would probably save you guys a lot of internal right. phone calls well see this is an interim the Twitter is an interim because we're going to this technology roadmap we have an outage <coughs> management system that's integrated into our GIS and it it will send out uh, through an IVR system so we're trying to just create an interim to, to be able to communicate with the public but we are going to be putting in a typical utility uh, notification system I just think Facebook, you get more reach and you get there quicker. Yeah. The, the other issue is it's the control room operators that, you know, that switch the system uh, that are also doing the Twitter. We don't really have someone that can run into the control room, get the information, come out. We don't really have someone that can um, do that. So it is actually coming from the control room operators as they get information back from the field, uh, which is why the information goes out and we, we're not really in a position to respond to any direct tweets that come back. So that's where we are right now. But we are looking into Facebook, and again, it's, it's another thing to maintain. So we're, you know, we have to work with the unions, we've got to work with the job descriptions to see how we can, we can manage that, again, in the interim. Because it, when we go to this new system, we're probably not going to be using any of those except for maybe community uh, relations things that are going on and not necessarily for outages. Okay. Um, I want to totally apologize because you won the Tech Tip Award last year. No way. You did. <laughs> you totally <Really>? won. <laughs> You're going to have to come back and give it's a little okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> and now I'm like embarrassed and I'm shot. wondering. No, I did get, I did get a, a t shirt in the mail and a nice letter from you <laughs> saying that you were going to take it forward, but I didn't know any more than that. Oh, no, but it said on the letter you won the Tech Tip Award. Oh, it did? Oh, yeah. I apologize. Yeah, you probably did. I apologize. No, Thank that's you. okay. I love the t shirt I wear all the time. Yeah. But okay, good. This I'm, app, I'm like, thought I was It would be really helpful if, if there was something there for outages so you could just see, because every day you must have. There so is. It the, is Twitter tweet, is tweet, on tweet, there. Yeah, see, I don't use Twitter. No, but you can follow Twitter right on there. You don't, you don't to need to have it. a Twitter oh, account. okay. Thank you. Now, the only problem with Twitter on the app is there's, I don't think it's been date fixed, stamp. a date stamp. Um, and it has something to do with the mobile type thing. So you'll see that there's an outage, 
but you'd have to go to the website uh, or a regular Twitter account to get the date stamp. But you can f you can see what's happening as it comes in right on there. Um, I'll double check if you if you want to look and yeah, see. I'm trying. Let me do it, but that's okay. But yay, you won. Oh, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over to Hamid for the next slide on the proactive um, maintenance programs. Yes. Back in 2014, we started the, uh, we uh, evaluated the entire system and, and we came up with a, a good program in order to uh, get into new proactive maintenance program. We did a comprehensive substation maintenance, which uh, included the developing a cyclic substation maintenance program, which is every three years, every piece of the equipment in the substations, they're going to be tested and they're going to be evaluated for integrity. Uh, we created uh, and formally formed of a technical services group for distribution system maintenance program, which they go in the substations and by the extensive training that we provided for them, they now they are able to test the equipment and uh, <coughs> replace the and replace the equipment or repair them as needed. Uh, we also developed and revitalized system maintenance program. There are eight programs that were developed as a result of that comprehensive system evaluations. You see those eight programs, uh, transformer re replacement pro programs. So far, we've replaced 354 age transformer, which we got like 1,866 of them. The pole testing, uh, we, are, we are testing 10% of the RMLD custodial poles every year. and. Part of the reason for double poles are because you know the system hasn't been maintained for so many years, for 10, 15 to 20 years. Now it's catching up with us. So as we test these poles, and we see that you know where well, there is that the test fails, or some of them that they're critical. So we get to the critical items first, and then you know followed by you know hopefully the transfers that Verizon and Comcast they do then you know we we put them on the priority basically depending on the uh, severity of the case so that explains some of those uh, double poles that you know you you see and why they're there we're going through c extensive program in order to uh, catch up with the ones that you know the test show that you know failed for public safety so in the manhole inspection program uh, approximately 80 percent of the manholes in the system has been te actually visualized and tested for integrity the tree trimming uh, cycle, it's three year cyclic program that re revamped the entire tree trimming and it's uh, actually it's paying off. The reliability has improved tremendously by doing that. The porcelain cutout replacement, about 91% is uh, actually completed, replaced with the polymer type because these used to be, uh, these are the uh, porcelain cutouts that they shatter and you know, it's really posing a safety issue for mostly the em employees and line workers. 91% of them are completed and that's an ongoing process. Quarterly inspection of the lines, 13.8 kV and 35 kV feeders, our crews, they go out on, on routine patrolling of the lines and if they see any obviously obvious signs of uh, deterioration or any problems, they take care of those. Uh, uh, the infrared is scanned at the substation, major uh, underground, uh, basically, basically these are the parks, that if there are any size, uh, signs of deteriorations or any problems, again, we address them before they uh, becoming a problem. Uh, the last one is a secondary main and service upgrade program, which basically it's addressing, again, the aged uh, infrastructure in all four communities, the services. The next slide talks about our efficiency and our peak reduction programs. Um, all of our rebates are currently based on peak reduction, and that's a little different than National Grid. Because capacity and transmission is a driving force in our increasing power supply costs, we've restructured our rebates to um, encourage peak reduction. Um, so in addition to both our commercial and our residential program, as part of our paperless campaign, uh, we've launched an online application process to eliminate the paper process. For those who don't have online access, you can still fill out a paper application, but for the majority of our customers, uh, they can go online now. They can fill a reply appliance rebate and where it'll bring up the efficiency of appliance. It'll fill in the amounts and that will get processed and the credit will be on the customer's bill. 
So we're hoping that that's a, um, an improvement in both efficiency and paperless um, for our customers as well as RMLD. Uh, we have a commercial energy in incentive program where we'll offer up to 50,000 for commercial and municipal customers who do peak redu reduction programs. Uh, we have um, an electric vehicle charging rate for both our residential and commercial customers. Uh, we'll rebate up to 50% of the cost of an electric charging station as well as uh, the installation costs. Uh, we have several customers from North Reading who have applied for that and received that um, for their home charging stations. Um, we have a peak demand reduction program that we work with our municipals and our commercial customers where we incentivize them and we share the savings for that. Uh, the North Reading High School was a good example of a customer who's part of that program and has achieved some peak reduction uh, savings and has received those credits on their bills. Um, in addition, we have an online store for light bulbs. If uh, customers are interested in purchasing LED light bulbs, they can go online and those get shipped directly to their homes. Um, and uh, customers also have the ability to have energy audits in their home. We have a third party vendor that will go in. We have um, an RMLD bag of LED light bulbs that we, we bring to the audit and we do a whole house audit, a fuel blind audit for those customers. Um, and those are free um, of charge to the customer. Uh, currently, uh, in order to manage our peak demand, we're installing a two and a half megawatt generating uh, unit in our, at our North Reading substation. Uh, that we hope to be installed by, uh, it's planned to be installed by July 1st. And as a, re as a result of that reduction, uh, going forward, uh, the RMLD has the potential to save in excess of $300,000 by capturing that summer peak and, and displacing that high uh, peak demand uh, usage because it's behind the meter for us. Just in relation to the uh, residential energy audits, mm -hmm. I mean, I've had, again, I wasn't that aware of it either, but uh, is it similar to what uh, National Grid? Yeah, it's very the, similar to MassSave. The actual Mass the, the vendor that we currently utilize does audits for both MassSave as well as RMLD. It's slightly different in that um, for National Grid's gas customers, uh, they have options to a little more programs because it's built within their gas bill. Uh, they, can, they can qualify for zero cost financing if they were going to upgrade their gas furnace or some insulation rebates. Because we're an electric utility and we recover those costs through an energy conservation charge on their bill, which is considerably less than that charged by the gas company. Uh, so we're always looking to improve that, but we just don't, they don't have access to those aspects of a mass save audit. So as far as the energy audits, uh, give us for instance as to what the package is. Uh, sure. Uh, the package as the auditor goes out or what we, what we provide. Sure. We just provide um, a power strip, we provide some night lights, some LED um, light bulbs, and then the, the vendor will, will call, will schedule an audit, and they'll do, you know, a full blown audit. They'll look at your furnace, they'll look at your appliances, they'll look at insulation leaks. Um, so they'll do a whole, a, what they call is a fuel blind audit, whether it's gas or electric, and they'll give recommendations to the customer uh, in order to make improvements in the efficiency of the home. Okay. Oh, uh, in addition, uh, we are planning a ribbon cutting ceremony at our North Reading uh, uh, generator um, sometime in July. So we'll be reaching out to uh, the board for that. Thank you, Colin. For that. Oh, yeah. um, I'm just going to let Hamid give a little bit of a construction update on the generator. The two and a half megawatt generator is currently the engine just arrived uh, two weeks ago, and it's installed, it's on the pad, and assembled. So we're hoping that you know we can start it up uh, the first week in July. Uh, so uh, right now it's at the permitting stage with the town. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a few minor issues that hopefully that those are going to be resolved tomorrow, and then we can proceed with the permit and open up and you know basically run the gas pipe from national grid to the engine. And once we do that, we are ready to test it, and that's going to bring some savings for the ratepayers. It's really we are looking forward to getting that project up and running. Um, the next slide talks about our solar choice program. Uh, we have uh, just installed our first community solar project. Um, it is located uh, in Balladville on uh, 
326 Valleyville. Yeah. It's approximately a one megawatt system. And the way the program is structured is we have 500 participants or residential customers that have elected to be on the solar choice rate. And those customers will receive the benefit and the cost associated with that particular program. Um, so the financials work out um, so that each customer will re incur approximately a $5 um, surcharge for the first 12 months. And that's basically the difference between the cost of the solar versus the cost of the overall portfolio. So there's, there's a slight premium associated with the solar uh, because of the installation. In month 13, we'll look back to see what that solar was generating on those peak days, on those hot summer days, and any benefits uh, arrived by that solar will go to those 500 participants. So it's currently projected that those customers over a 10 year period will receive about a $300 savings. Um, it's very, it was very well received. We have over 500 customers. We have a, a waiting list for our second project. And we're hoping to reach out to the communities to continue this program as long as there's a demand from our customer base. Yep, um, and if I know uh, we, we've reached out to the town uh, historically um, to determine if, if the town would be interested in putting out an RFP for any town related buildings. Um, and so we're reaching out to the other towns and we can follow up to see, um, again, it's no obligation. Uh, the way we would structure the RFP is because the costs are associated with the location of the solar array and the, the actual building and what has to get done. Um, we put, it would at least allow the town the opportunity to review the financials to see if it would be cost effective for the town to proceed forward. Um, so I'm reaching out personally to all the four towns that we serve. And again, it's totally up to each uh, community whether it's something they want to look at or if it's not the right timing or whatnot. So I'll be happy to follow up with um, the town manager to, de to determine that. Okay, so if it's a municipal rooftop, they receive um, correct. So right now, uh, on the commercial side, um, the way it's structured is um, the commercial owner receives a lease payment from the developer. The town, uh, the light department sounds, signs a purchase power agreement and takes the offtake of the solar, and then the town receives personal property tax um, on a commercial site. So if it was a municipal roof, there's the potential for the, the municipality to receive the lease payment from the developer, and we're, we're trying to make that determination if you would receive tax, personal property tax from that where your municipality, we're not sure if that would be applicable. Um, so we would explore that opportunity with you. Has any towns taken you up on this? Um, I'm, I'm reaching out, I'm setting up a meeting with Wilmington, and I'm also working with uh, Reading received uh, the information and, and wants me to reach back out with them after the fiscal year. Thank you. The next slide uh, talks about economic development. Um, as the board is fully aware, um, Tom O'Lilla from our group from Reading Light um, is an associate member on North Reading's Economic Development Task Force. Um, so we're always uh, willing to work with the town of North Reading. Uh, we feel that as a light department, we provide some attractive um, attributes uh, in terms of the low cost, locally owned and operated. Our reliability seems to be very uh, much appreciated by the customers that we serve compared to those of an investor-owned utility. Uh, the response time, um, the customer service programs, the low rates, so they're, they're all attributes that will assist the town um, in, in attracting new load or new opportunities. Yeah, Tom's been a great asset to the committee. He's an associate mm -hmm. member. And, uh, he's been fantastic, great. so we thank you for allowing his uh, time to be focused on our PDC. Thank you. This slide shows the reliability indices. Basically, these are the industry indices that uh, shows basically the well-being of the system. We've got system average interruption duration, customer average interruption duration, and system average interruption frequency index. So the lines that you see, the bars, the uh, yellow bars, the brown, brown bar, would show you the regional average. And the bar above that, the blue one, shows the uh, national average. So as you could see, in all indices, we're below the national and the regional average. 
Now I just want to mention something about 2014. You see that, you know, this is when we started that comprehensive proactive maintenance program that started, you know, we the aging infrastructure started showing off and then with the comprehensive maintenance program we started bringing it down at least to manage it to a level that you know it's acceptable for now however we got a long way to go we got like catching up like 15 years of uh, neglect so but we are making progress good progress that shows that reliability in the seas the next one shows the outage causes, basically the causes that of the outages uh, annually from 2012 to 2017 for five years. 35% uh, of the outages were related to equipment failures, 30% uh, were trees, 21% were wildlife, and we had a number of motor vehicle accidents and the weather caused all of those that basically shows uh, what really caused those uh, outages. The next slide is the LED street light program, which we are on target. Basically, annually, we are committed from FY15, which we started the pilot program, to uh, FY18 to replace uh, 2,450 in each fiscal year, officially starting from FY16, 17, and 18. Total of 8,000 uh, light system wide. Uh, in the pilot uh, program, we replaced 300 uh, lights uh, all, all over the system. 62 of those were in North Reading, and the full, full implementation, we started FY16. Uh, for North Reading, FY16, we replaced 581, and in FY17, we, so far, we've replaced uh, 516, which is going to be 580 by, the, by June, by next week, technically. And then we got another 500, then less than 500, 300 or so, 320 or so, that it's going to be uh, left for FY18, which is going to bring some savings. Yes, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So that 300 or so, are those largely shut off lights? Some of them, yeah, yes. Okay. Exactly. I'm going to go over the, uh, the next slide shows the breakdown. Go ahead. So uh, to answer your question, uh, Mike, <coughs> The town originally had asked the light department um, when we were approaching with the LED conversion program. This first section was the existing active street lights, which there were about 20, 1,200 to 1,300 of those, because some of those had been replaced when this slide was created. So the anticipated cost of those um, existing, uh, LED, existing street lights, non-LED, was approximately $61,000 annually. We then approached the, the board um, and said, you know, if we converted that, there would be the cost would go down to around forty-two thousand, and then the determination was made to put on the shutoffs. So, based on this slide, uh, the the current projections and they're estimated because the rates change biannually. So, this is to kind of give you a flavor of what's what the magnitude is. Uh, the cost to turn on those streetlights will be about thirteen thousand dollars annually which would leave the town of North Reading with an estimated net savings after all the lights were converted of, of around a little less than $6,000. Um, so in the billing system, we're working, so we, we owe you a credit to finish up 2016, so that should be, um, that you will receive that in your July bill, we're working on that. Um, and then as Hamid said, uh, we're working by the end of fiscal 18 to convert all of the active lights as well as the shutoff. So there'll be a full conversion by the end of fiscal year 18. Yeah. So um, if it's okay with the board, I was just going to update the board. Um, our, our, the, the department has recently um, completed our cost of service study. Every three years we actually go through and uh, redo an actual cost of service study. So we, we update it in years two and then uh, in years one and two and then on the year third we do a, a full cost of service. Uh, so we met with, uh, we had our consultant do, um, uh, and we looked at the long term strategic objectives of that cost of service study. And what we're trying to do is a, adjust some of the subsidies that have occurred over time and as customers pattern usage are changing. And so some of the objectives are to actually collect the cost of service per class, whether it's residential, commercial, uh, time, industrial time of use, street lighting, et cetera. 
Um, we're also looking to ensure that our commercial rate, where we have our high uh, load factor customers, uh, is set so that we at, uh, attract and retain our customers because that impacts all of our customers across the board. Um, in addition, what we want to make sure is that the rates reflect what those cost of services are um, and to ensure that we're encouraging peak reduction during those times as those capacity and um, transmission costs continue to increase. We want to make sure we're sending pricing signals, especially to those commercial customers, that they, that they account for those. Um, and so as a result of that, our board uh, had a commission meeting last Thursday and we've voted uh, to uh, uh, file new rates effective July 1st. And so the gist of this, um, we were meeting with all the towns to describe what we anticipated the loads would be in the beginning of the year. Um, and unfortunately, we're meeting with you after your, after your budget season. But uh, on average, uh, the municipal and commercial rates are going up around 35 to 4%. Um, the school rate is going up 45 to 5%. Our residential rates are around 6.6%, um, and our industrial time of use is around 5 to 7%, with the residential time of use around 7.7%. Um, so we'll be issuing a press release on that. We'll have those rate uh, changes on our website. Um, they need to be filed with the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, and then we also encourage customers um, to reach out to our website for efficiency programs or ways that they can manage their usage to manage the increase. A large portion of that increase is related to capacity and transmission costs. Um, because we're located in the Northeast Massachusetts unit, uh, region um, and footprint power is coming online, capacity is at a premium right now. Um, and I, I believe we spoke about that at the last meeting that we were here. Um, and Colleen has, when, as when she started these meetings in 2014, um, we, we were kind of vocalizing that capacity and transmission are going up, be prepared, and the time has come where we we're actually incurring those costs effective June 1st. So the municipality, you 3.5% to 4? Yeah, correct. In the school, you said? 4.5 uh, to 5. The economic programs uh, or the efficiency programs that Jane spoke of earlier, you know, kind of dovetail into you know, us getting this generator up and going and, and the reduction and, you know, in, integrated into the schools and everything at the same time to try to offset this, these capacity and transmission increases. So, um, you know, we think the timing has worked well and we want to stay on top of that. You know, there'll always be new charges that come in, especially in this particular area. We are in the end of a pipeline. You know, we're not like a wagon wheel being fed from all different uh, potential sources like uh, Ohio or something. We're just at the end of the pipeline. It's very tough in this area. So I think the, the team does a great job in, in working all these different programs to try to mitigate the impact. So, um, How are your so shred the peak. comparing with the other utilities? Other utilities? Uh, we, we do a comparison rate um, through NEPA and through uh, MWEC and we're middle of the pack. It depends on what rate class you're talking about, but we, in over, overall we're in the middle pack on everything, slightly so below. Yes. Residential, we're in the middle of the pack? Are you yes. An outlier? Every, every single one of them is just about in the middle of the pack between um, 1 and 41 municipals. Um, but when I say middle of the pack, we, you know, you're, you'd have to look at the rate class and, and you're looking the at it, the, the, the dollar differential, because you know, the scale could be very tight. Do you know what I mean? So if you want, the next time we can, we can do, show you a rate comparison if you'd like, or we can send some to Mike and you can uh, send them out yeah. to you. But yeah, yeah just about in the middle of the pack. So, and it's, it, it's very, I mean, we can compare it to the IOUs that are contiguous to us and say, oh, we're 30% less. We don't have double digit increases. Um, but as far as the municipal is concerned, it all depends on what's in your portfolio. A lot of these long-term power contracts that were, you know, deals written, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, each utility, municipal utility is set up a little bit different as to what that utility purchased for long-term power. Um, and so at some point we can do a presentation of what's in our portfolio and, and how much we have in the market and how we, we, uh, we use rich risk mitigation to um, 
you know, to make sure that we get the best price going forward for anything that's open in the market. So it's a, it's a whole very interesting uh, side of the business. Okay. But um, I think we're doing really well. And uh, as Jane said, with the economic development, we, we worked really hard in Wilmington. We got Osram to come in. Um, you know, it depends on what each town wants, but Wilmington was, you know, wanted some economic development. So, you know, what we have to offer at RMLD works really well with some of these customers. Fits in nicely, so. Um, two more slides you have left, I'm sorry. Just one. Just one, great. The one that we should have gotten done when you brought it up at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> You're on. All right. The last slide, it's the basic shows the double pole status. If you look at the RMLD, this is ball and court. This is the engine program that's shared between uh, all the utilities that basically shows the ball and court. In Reading, in municipal light, we have um, 12 poles that we need to transfer as of uh, yet. And we got about 99 pole but that we need to remove from the uh, streets. Now, I just want to explain for you about these double poles. I know it's a concern, but it's a good thing that, you know, we're getting to them, we're upgrading them, because we have two categories. One is uh, from the safety aspect, which is public and also employee safety. Uh, that's why we test them, and is, uh, as they test it, they fail or marginally fail, or if they could wait until we get to them. So we get to them in that order of priority, the ones that they pose safety in all three, four communities, we get to them first. So the safety is one aspect. The second aspect is the construction and upgrading the system. Any opportunity we get when we install a new switch or we run wires, we're not gonna do that on the old poles. The pole that we know next year, it's gonna have to basically, it's reaching the end of its useful life. So we're upgrading those, which is a good thing. I mean, it's a healthy thing for the system to do. It's improving the reliability. And uh, we are getting to them in the importance or the level of uh, the, the, the criticalness that, you know, we need to get to them. So what is it? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's uh, 99. Then the Verizon got 16 poles that need to transfer, but when they need to take eight poles out. These are the sole owned. And then they got the National Grid, one transfer, Comcast, one transfer, and one uh, third par party attached. The fire department also has uh, 44 poles that they need to do the transfers. Okay. Mr. Masseri. Did we get a copy of that? Is the fire department aware of the number they have? I can give them one. Uh, I asked if there'd be communication leading up to the meeting. I'm not sure whether they're aware or not. Okay, that's fine. We'll make sure that they are. We, yeah, that would be good. Mike, we'll send you an electronic copy of the entire presentation um, if you want. Yeah. Or you can, you can download yeah, it. I think that. I would appreciate that, and we'll make it available to the board. I would also appreciate that if it's not available, that it be produced, the list of the locations that are in the custody of the North Reading Fire Department, that we get that so that we can see yeah. what the issue is there. They may have the ability to log into the system and get it. It may help to produce a list so that we can review it with them. So and I can follow up with you afterwards, Colleen. We do have a public hearing uh, that we have to get to, but I wanted to give the board members an opportunity to just ask any last questions you may have. Or something is a, a, a duplicitous. In other words, you know, you have multiple people on one pole. I mean, how are you counting this? You know, if there's one pole that Reading Municipal Light has, mm -hmm. but also North Reading Fire's on it and Comcast is on it, it's still one pole, right? That's right. still one pole. It's still one pole. So, so how is this? So this isn't cumulative necessarily. Right. Um, so of the 44 that North Reading Fire has to get off right. of, right. it's it's 100. What is that? I don't have my glasses. 182. 182. Yeah. Yeah. There's 182 right. double poles, right. okay. and whether they're in there waiting for a transfer or they're right. waiting for the pole butt to be pulled, there's 182 right. in this town, mm -hmm. um, which is similar to other other towns. The little stubs that are hanging off does that count as a double yes. pole? Yes, that's right. Okay. With the subs that, you know, if everyone has transferred, now is the last person, I mean, in the North Reading, it's in our custodial area. Same as half the Reading. Then we go and pull the uh, pole but out. We install the pole and remove the pole. Mr. Benjamin. So, Jane, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, 
just, it's just, I might not be reading this right, but right now at least 99 of those yes. you can get rid of. That's right. Right. What's your plan to get rid of at least 99 of those? Because that looks like those are freed up and ready to They're go. Free, yes, when yes. will you get rid of those? You are getting to the, 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 uh, the Do you have a, a, like a, let, let me have a meeting day? with the general right. foreman because we, like I said, we, we've upgraded so many poles, right. um, so many new circuits, new switches, uh, a lot of work mm -hmm. in the last three years, a, a lot. So a lot of them that were old came out. I can't speak to the ones that have been sitting on that. I want to find out exactly what street he's talking about and, and make sure that I understand why those are hanging out there. They shouldn't be there for more than you know a year or two. But we have 8,000 poles, and we're, we're going through each of the four towns, and there's a lot. So we are. Yeah. I was just curious because, yep. for example, that the public hearing we had on Nichols, right. when you said you're going to put one in and take two out, right. uh, as a lay person or a non technician, right. I would assume you're doing that simultaneously. We're in this street, we're installing, and we're removing at the same time. Oh, it takes, sometimes it takes a it long takes, time for yeah. everyone to finish the transfers. Any more questions? You know, Mr. And, and wait, just Sorry. so I, I can't speak to this because I didn't see it last week, but uh, we could have just gotten 50 of them dumped right. in our box right. and it would have been 40 yesterday because I'm looking at 99 and it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that much. But I'm just saying it does change. But we are going to put the history together as Mr. Prisco has asked. Okay. Any, Mr. Messier. Just a comment to the question we raised is uh, that Typically, the length of time is not a running light issue. It's Comcast, Horizon, and sometimes our fire department to move the remaining wires from either the chunk of pole or whatever they've done to the new pole. And why I had brought the question up and I had asked that question was related to the fact that coming up next year is the uh, Verizon and Comcast renewals. And when we went through the renewal of their contract with the town, we did get, we, we had a fair amount of leverage back the first time around, especially with Verizon, to get a lot of their work done on the poles. And, you know, if they don't move the stuff, the poles just sit there. Well, and it's not, it's not ready lights problem. I mean, the maybe status they doesn't should be show yelling that story, at, though. But, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank, thank you. Thank you very much. You. And we look forward to getting your message on the ribbon cutting. Yes. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, read that. we'll try to be there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. All right. We, don't have, we can have a call. Right. Right. We closed that one. Public hearing for the water rates. In accordance with the recommend, recommend yeah, <coughs> sorry. In accordance with the requirements of section 191-16 and 191-17 of the code of North Reading, the Board of Selectmen and the no North Reading Water Commission will hold an annual water rate and water system capital plan hearing on Monday, June 19, 2017 at 8 p.m. in room 14 of North Reading Town Hall. And I hope everybody's windows are closed. You want to take a second and go close them? Is it raining out? It's pouring out. That's what you get for scheduling the water right after the electricity. <laughs> Mark, the floor is all yours, okay. sir. If you could just you announce who you are so the folks at home. Sure, I'm Mark Clark. I'm the water superintendent Thank here in North Reading. I'm also joined by uh, the DPW director, Andrew Lafferty, is here with me, and Vin Raguchi, who's the chair of the Water Commission, is here tonight. So uh, what we're going to hope to do is go through the uh, water rate recommendations for the next fiscal year. Uh, this is a slide that actually was presented back in 2015. It had to do with kind of a 10-year look at the rates as we made the transition to, uh, from the Andover and our own sources to the MWRA. 
Uh, as you can see, the rates kind of go up and down. There's a low year of 2.8% and a high year of 10.7%, but the 10-year average was about just over 7%. Um, the rates we actually enacted in FY16, we had an 8% rate increase. Last year, we had a 6% rate increase. Uh, and when I'm saying a rate increase, I'm talking about on, we have a three-tiered rate structure, so we equally increase the rates on each of those tiers, and uh, that was the, the primary change to the rates last, the last two years. Uh, if you were at town meeting, which I know all, all the selectmen were, this is what was acted on in town meeting. There was uh, $8.22 million in capital improvement in Article 14 associated with making the transition to the MWRA. As you can see, there's $2.55 million for the construction of the pump station, there's a million dollars for improvements to the North Reading piping systems, and 4.67 million for improvements to the Reading piping systems in order to allow that connection to, uh, to function properly. And then just a MWRA project update. Uh, as you're aware, we received legislative approval late in 2016. We uh, acquired a piece of property on Mill Street early this year. Uh, we continue to do permitting work. Uh, we're anticipating filing our final environmental impact report in the fall. Uh, as you are aware, we submitted the D or the draft environmental impact report last year. Final in involves responding to the comments, incorporating the comments, and just basically uh, moving forward with any issues that there might be with the project. Um, we continue to do design work. Um, we're working with Reading towards a uh, intermunicipal agreement. We're looking to actually bid the construction work of the pumping station and then the piping in both towns in the late fall and begin construction probably uh, early next construction season in, F in uh, 2018 with the goal of being completed and activating the interconnection a little over 24 months from today. And then after that we would eventually look to decommission the, uh, the town wells. So just a look at where we are in terms of, we have uh, two basic reserve funds. One, as most of you are aware, is the older Stickney Fund, which is a settlement from the loss of the Stickney Well back in the 1970s. There's still about $132,000 in that fund. Uh, we also have what we call the Water Department Infra Infrastructure Stabilization Fund. Uh, prior to town meeting, there was about $450,000 in that. Uh, so the two, total two funds before town meeting were about $580,000. At town meeting, we acted to take the retained earnings from last fiscal year of $511,000 and add them to these funds. There were also two small capital projects uh, funded out of this for a negative $70,000. So right now, as of today, there's just over a million dollars, a million twenty-one thousand dollars in the uh, combined Stickney and Water Department infrastructure stabilization funds. Uh, those of you that were on the board back in the the about eight or ten years ago, remember we took some money out of these funds, we uh, made a commitment to pay the money back to those funds over five years. We'll probably drop the bottom half of this slide next year, but we are at the point where we have done what we committed to the board to do and having paid back that, uh, that $530,000 into those funds. And you can see at the top, you know, we put money in, we've taken money out for small projects, so we are using this fund actively to, to try to offset, you know, some of the rate jump that we might have. Uh, you're familiar with this FY18 budget, uh, kind of the highlighted issue items down at the bottom. FY17 total water department budget, just over $4 million. FY18 water department budget is about $4.3 million. Uh, it's hard to see, but if you look at it, the, the primary increases come from the debt service. Debt service is $520,000 in FY17. It's increased by about $240,000, so it's $758,000 in FY18. Uh, 18. Um, the primary driver in that, and we'll see that in a minute, is the uh, the water meter project is uh, hitting the, the debt service. Just the backup for this, this is very small and I apologize, it's kind of hard to read, but uh, it's in your packet. So the debt service, I'm going to zoom in on this. Um, well, what you see is, you know, this project going all the way back to the uh, right around 2003 on this. The longest bonded project we have expires about 2027. There will be additional projects as we go forward, so we're not going to run out of debt service in 2027. This does not show the MWRA debt service on it or any other uh, future projects. So the ones kind of highlighted in red on the top are the new things hitting, uh, hitting this year. Uh, 
So I'm sorry, the pumping station land project is a huge one, and then the meter replacement. Those are kind of the two big drivers. We purchased that uh, piece of property for a little over $700,000. So just to zoom in on that, these are the five projects, interconnection design, the FEIR, water re meter replacement, some upgrades in our distribution system, and then the pumping station land. Those are the five new ones. Uh, you can see the total this year is just under $750,000. Um, a little different than what was on the prior slide because there's a little bit of temporary bonding interest or ban interest. There's about $10,000 of that. So the total debt service for this year is about $758,000. Um, again, you can see as things get paid off, and there's, there are columns to the left of this you're not seeing, but you see the debt service drop off. So it drops off about $60,000 and then about another $90,000. It drops off with some of those projects fairly quickly. Again, we will be uh, proposing additional projects, and there is additional work, especially that stuff that got approved at June Town Meeting is not shown in this debt service, but will be in future years. Um, one of the questions we get fairly frequently is, we're the Water Enterprise Fund, so we're not able to, to tap into uh, the health care system without paying our fair share of it. So this slide just shows from FY16 to FY19, we're uh, increasing the indirect costs that the water department pays for by about 3% a year. You can see the total for FY18 is about $445,000. So this is kind of a, this is a slide we like to look at to kind of compare where are we this year compared to where we are, where we were the prior year. Um, again, we increased water rates by about 6% from FY16 to FY17. You know, July, I mean, it, we're, we're up 322% in July, and, and that's not a billing month, so it's kind of hard to say what that is. But if you look, last summer was a very dry summer. We were up, you know, plus 20% over where we were the prior fiscal year. As you get into the winter months, the, the, the high demands of the summer wash out. Right now, we're going to be, we're going to wind up the year about 9% higher from a billing standpoint than we were in FY16. So we went up 6% on the rates. Why did the billing go up 9%? It's because we sold a lot of water last summer. We tried to encourage people to conserve, but in a dry summer, we always sell a lot of water. We base our, our rate projections on an average year, not an extremely dry year like we had last year. So subsequently, when you look at it, um, water billing, this is the total that we anticipate billing this year. Um, our budget was, as I said, just over $4 million, so $4.5 million billed for. Last year we didn't collect 10% of our budget, $417,000. That gets leaned and brought in this year. This year we're projecting we're not going to collect about 11%, so that's, that's a minus. So it's basically what are we projecting for retained earnings? It's how much did we bill minus our budget plus what we brought in from last year minus what we're not going to collect this year and that comes up to about 410000 So we said last year we had $511,000 we transferred into retained earnings. Somewhere in the order of $400,000 is going to be what we'll have for a figure next year. That does anticipate that we spend 100% of our budgeted money. Um, I will just say we're not going to spend 100% of our budgeted money, especially on the salary side. There's a couple positions that have not been filled. So there will be, you know, that, that projected retained earnings may be a little bit higher than that going into next year. We show this slide, analysis of the rate of adjustment. So we had $511,000, if you look the second block down, $511,000 in retained earnings last year. We're projecting $410,000 in retained earnings next year, or in this current fiscal year, to be transferred in next year. So what we're really looking at is, again, here's where it comes down to. We're looking at an average year of water demand, similar to what we had in FY15. We're not looking at these two years where we had fairly high uh, retained earnings. So we look at our budget. We're looking to, uh, the stated goal has been to generate a modest amount of retained earnings. And by modest, the number we've used in the past has been plus or minus $100,000. So when we do that, our budget is $4.3 If we project out a 6% rate increase gives us 
4,410,000, that's about $100,000 in retained earnings. So to kind of cut to the chase, what are we recommending? We're recommending that if this coming fiscal year is an average fiscal year, in order to generate $103,000 in retained earnings, we would need that 6% rate increase for, for the coming fiscal year. What does that mean if we were to uh, do a 6% rate increase? And this is in your packet. We basically look at a low use, a medium use, and a high use family. And this is actually the medium use family. So if you look at this, you know, it's a, a medium use. By medium use, we're, we're defining it as a family that uses 90,000 gallons a year or 22,500 gallons a quarter. What would happen to their bill with a 6% rate increase? Their quarterly bill will go out about, up about $14.50. Their annual bill is four times that. It's about $58. And then this is a new slide that I threw in this year. It's kind of taken a 10-year look out from uh, where we are now and just basically projecting what our expenses are going to be, what our debt service are going to be, and then as we transition to MWRA, uh, there's going to be a point where MWRA, those debt service projects, hit the books fairly hard. There's going to be a point a couple years after that where the MWRA buy-in cost, we're able to defer that for three years, but there's going to be a point where we're going to have to start paying back that buy-in cost. So if you look at it, the rates in this jump, you know, about 6.75% 6, 6 this year, 1% next year, 8, 2.5, 0.1, and then 8%, and then it kind of levels off. Um, so again, there are kind of some spiky years and some lower years. Um, I kind of like to look at, you know, not a single individual year, but what does it do over a couple of years, too? And you can see we're, at, we're still at about that 5 to 6% uh, average rate increase for the next couple of years. And as you see, it eventually tails off as we, as we get into the project. Again, some of the other older debt service starts to uh, fade away as we get out here. Um, some of the costs that we're also, there's some personnel costs. Um, so we anticipate as we go to MWRA, we won't need as many staff in the water department. There's some, in, uh, some uh, indirect costs associated with that will go down a little bit. Our expenses will go down a little bit as well. Once we go to MWRA, we won't have to use as much electricity. So we're not operating our own pumps. We're not going to use as many uh, chemicals. So some of those costs will fade away. So there are some drops in, in our budget to offset a little bit the increases that we're projecting in the budget. Uh, we are showing a wheeling charge. This is uh, what would, what would uh, Reading cost us to basically uh, pump water through their system. So we've been showing that as about 5% uh, of the MWRA cost. We don't have a, a firm agreement yet with, with Reading with respect to that, but we did want to kind of account for that as we're going forward. And then this is basically just what the, uh, the rates and the fees would be uh, based on the recommendations we've made. Um, the Water Commission did agree to support the recommendation. There should be a, a copy of their letter to you in the packet. Um, I do believe they're, in, they're recommending to do a more formal and uh, more in-depth rate study as we go forward. Um, obviously, we're changing out the meters. That's going to have an impact. We, we anticipate we're going to bill for a little more because the new meters will be more accurate. We'll be able to find problems with meters more quickly. Um, but that's basically where we are. So we're, the water department uh, is recommending a, a basically a 6% rate increase on all three tiers from FY17 into FY18. Um, I'll say this just for clarity. Uh, the way we bill the water rates, even though we're saying they're effective July 1st, they're for any bill issued after July 1st. So we don't read all the meters June 30th in order to be able to bill at the new rate July 1st. So the rates actually go back to the end of the last billing quarter. And with that, I, I guess I take any questions. I have one for you. So when you start looking at the out years associated with MWRA, you use a percentage of increase. Did you get that directly from MWRA or are you just using sort of a industry standard? So yeah, so what we factored for the MWRA is basically based on their historical information and then information they've provided for years going forward. So we look back over the last 10 years. Um, the average over the last 10 years is just about 4% for their rate increases. And then as I actually went to a, uh, a MWRA rate seminar and they kind of project their rates and their goal is kind of the, the catch term they've used is 4% and no more. So they're trying to set their rates or 
schedule their capital improvements such that they don't impact the rates any more than 4% in any given fiscal year. So they're, they're basically projecting that their wholesale rates to communities are going to go up about 4% per year. And this year, they're looking at probably a little over three, right? Uh, I'd have board. to go back to their numbers. But. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Mr. Mr. Yeah, just, in, just in relation to the, I'm sorry, just in relation to the uh, uh, new water meters. Again, we're anticipating a savings in revenue generation to help pay for the cost of that. And then the payback on that we're anticipating is going to be how long, and then I don't know whether that, that was factored in there or not, other than just factored in the debt service, but uh, there should be some sort of uh, stabilizing influence. Yeah, the, the, new me the new meter should be more accurate. Again, one of the things they'll give us, the way we currently read meters is for the most part, we physically go to your home, plug onto the box on the outside of your home, and we read your meter every 90 days or so. These new meters are going to read themselves every hour, and they're going to transmit to us every day those 24 prior hourly readings they have from you. So if your meter stopped or if your meter starts running backwards for some reason uh, or if your meter's running continuously, they measure and if they m detect flow every one of those 24 hours, it gives us some kind of some indices we can look to. Um, if your meter starts running backwards, uh, that's an indication that something's being done to monkey with the meter. Um, if there's continuous flow through the meter, it tells us there's a leak at your house. Um, so there, there are different things we'll be able to get from that that should make us a little more efficient. Um, but just the meters being more accurate than the meters currently, the, the meters we currently have are 20 plus years old. So meters tend to, they don't, t everyone wants them to run fast so they can challenge their bills. They don't run fast. They tend to run slow because they're a mechanical device. They tend to get a little corroded and they run a little slow. We don't think they're, they're extremely inaccurate at this point. They're a decent meter we put in 20 years ago, um, but we do anticipate uh, collect or generating more revenue just by them being more accurate going yeah, forward. As far as the timeline of installation, when can people expect to knock on the door? To uh, so we're, we're currently interviewing, we just finished interviewing four supplier companies for the meters. We're going to select a supplier, we're going to bid an installation contractor. We're looking plus or minus November 1st to, to actually physically get in the field and start replacing those meters. It's probably, uh, you know, for the 90 to 95 percent installation, it's probably a nine-month process. To get that last 5 percent is going to be difficult. It, it'll stretch a little bit, but we're going to push to get them all within a year. Yeah, sure. question. With the new meters, um, if something does go awry, as you just mentioned, Will the homeowner be notified by the water department? So there's a couple things we can do. There's actually, uh, we're looking at, uh, there's a customer interface portal with them where you can actually sign up to get leak alerts. You can sign, say you go to Florida for the winter and you know you should have no leak, at, no water use at your home. You can set a threshold where it'll actually notify you uh, that there's water use at your home even though no one's there. Um, but there will be ways for us also to, as we get leak flagged, it's going to be a process of shaking out, you know, as we learn the system, what's, what's a true flag and what's, you know, an annoyance alarm that's not really truly an alarm. So we're going to probably deal with those in-house before we make the information available directly to the customers to try to get rid of some of those uh, low-level nuisance types of alarms that any new system would have. But uh, there'll be the, definitely the capacity to provide much more customer service. Uh, from my standpoint, one of the interesting things is if we have certain water use restrictions on, we'll be able to run an, a report every morning without driving around at 4 o'clock and seeing who's got their sprinklers on. We'll see who watered every day. You know, if you had 1,000 gallons of use between 4 and 5 in the morning, we will know that. And, uh, so that'll, that'll be, I mean, from my standpoint, that's good data to have, good data to have to help promote water conservation as well. Any other questions? Okay. Mr. Gill. For the board's edification, I support the recommendation of the Department and the Water Commission for a 6% rate increase. I believe we have a motion that's in there. We left it blank, but the recommendation, as you've heard, is for 6%. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve a 6% increase in water use rates and to retain charges and fees at their current rates. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have Mr. O'Leary. Any more discussion? No. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work, especially the Water Commission. And I know you need more members, so anybody listening at home, they could certainly use some more adult supervision. <laughs> Good. Good. Thank you, Mr. Raguchi, for chairing the committee. Thank you, guys. We're going to close the public hearing. Eight forty five, so we have a another public hearing. Which one is this? So this is the uh, transfer, right? Yes. Common vehicular license, okay. Are we waiting on anyone for that? Oh, I didn't see him. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Raguchi, I, those broad shoulders, I did not get to see him. In accordance with the chapter one thirty eight of the Massachusetts General Law, a public hearing will be held by the Board of Selectmen in Room 14, Town Hall, two, 235 North Street, on Monday, June 19th at 8.45 p.m. on the application of Dos, Dos Lobos, yes. LLC, for the transfer of the common vehicular, all alcohol license to be exercised at 303 Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, a one-story building with seating capacity for 200 people, outdoor patio of approximately 706 square feet, entrance egress located in front of the rear of the building by the Board of Slackman. Okay. Mr. Gilberto, do you want to start us off with Certainly, any? Certainly, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, through you, just for the edification of the board members, in the meeting uh, folder for tonight's meeting, there are two items that, are, uh, that relate to this. The first, is a file that states uh, agenda item number seven, Dos Lobos license transfer application. And then the second is the accumulation of the departmental re reports relative to the request for transfer. And I believe in the first application, the first attachment, uh, you have a copy of a letter from the current license holder explaining the transition from their perspective as well. And uh, with that, uh, my suggestion would be to ask just for a brief presentation as to the intentions of the applicant. If you wouldn't mind coming to the podium and sure. just state your name. Uh, my name is Jim Dietz. Um, answer some questions or just kind of give a brief overall of what we're trying to do. Yeah, brief overall would great. be great. And then um, we can maybe ask some questions following. So we currently own Joe Fish in North Reading as well, uh, North Andover in the loft in North Andover as well. So we are looking to do a new concept. It's an American taqueria and tequila bar that will be going at 303 Main Street. Um, we'll be serving tacos with, it'll have a Southwest theme and uh, we'll be featuring um, different types of tequila, but uh, with the idea of tasting those tequilas and supporting our entrees with them. So everything will be tasting. Um, we don't intend on doing any shots. We won't have shot glasses in the building. Um, we, you know, it'll be a sit-down restaurant. We consider ourselves a restaurant, not a bar. It'll be um, a kids' menu, close to families, you know, attainable to everybody. Looking to close down uh, probably around 10, 30, 11. We don't really look for that late night business, none of our concepts do. Um, we're really into food and beverage as far as highlighting flavors and complementing flavors. Uh, is there any type of uh, live entertainment being planned? I know that um, Great American Tavern is set up for live entertainment, and um, we're going to keep that door open. We don't have any plans going in right now for live entertainment. Um, we're going to kind of see what the you know the market dictates. If we're getting a lot of requests for it, it's something we'll consider. Um, we have live entertainment at one of our locations in North Andover as well, um, and so we're keeping that door open. Mr. Missy, I'm oh, sorry. Follow up. Go ahead. Yeah, to follow up any outdoor seating? Um, probably not with the initial opening, because our first phase of construction really kind of is concentrated in the main dining area. That if, if you've been in the building, there's a secondary room. 
we're not doing much construction of that until we kind of figure out what that market dictates and what that room would be good for. At the area to the right when you walk yeah, in? Yeah, you walk and go to the right, exactly. And then the patio is kind of in that same wheelhouse. If So we're, we have no concrete plans to do anything with the patio in our first phase, which is our opening phase in construction of the main room. And then you have some neighbors kind of behind there. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, and we would obviously take recommendations on how to go about that and look at the, you know, the noise um, laws and all that stuff to, to continue down that path. Mr. Masseur. So you, are you familiar with what went on at American Cabin with the neighbors and some of the things that they were required to do, especially at times of leaving and uh, people going out to smoke out there? Um, not probably in depth. I've, I've heard a little bit about it. You should find out about that because those are challenges that we don't want to hear again. <laughs> okay. Um, Number one. Number two is my wife and I went into American Tavern once and we never went back. It was noisy as hell in there. Are you doing any reconstruction inside? Yes. What so, are your plans? So um, when we opened up Joe Fish in North Reading, we had a similar noise problem. So going into the construction here, we're actually taking avenues to prevent that. Um, so we've talked to our designer who's uh, working and we said, you know, everything that we put in the building should also have a noise dampening feature to it. So um, we're putting curtains floor to ceiling in some areas that will have some noise dampening. Um, also some light fixtures on the reverse side of them will be some um, acoustic paneling that will dampen some noise. I also know that Chuck, the, the current owner and soon to be previous owner, um, added a lot of noise up in the ceiling. He put foam through all that um, exposed ceiling to try to dampen the noise as well. Um, I think he did that within the year or so. So we are looking, um, you know, even just for our customer's sake, you want to be able to talk to the person that you're sitting next to. So noise control was actually something we brought up early on in the planning because we had dealt with that in our North Reading to a fish location. Thank you. Are you lowering the ceilings at all? No. Okay. I know they're pretty high in that building. They're pretty high in that building, yeah. The uh, light fixtures, um, we're working with the the foreman, I guess, to make sure that they don't affect any of the sprinkler heads and all that stuff, obviously. But no, there won't be any major construction or anything like that. Just in relation to uh, timelines, when are you going to take possession and then construction? Yep. And uh, the close date set for July 15th, and um, we're kind of organizing our general contractor and our designer to basically start renovation within that week as well. Hope to get renovation done in a month, a month and a half. Start training our staff end of August for a mid-September to early October open. And in that training, we will be doing, it'll be built into the training, it'll be a two-week course. TIP certification will be built in for all of our servers and bartenders, as well as the Serve Safe program. All that stuff will be built in to our training. So when we open those doors, all those certifications are already in. So what's gonna be your rec requested operating hours? Um, I haven't looked at that just yet, but I would assume it would probably be similar to, I would say, you know, open between 11.30 Monday through Saturday, close anywhere between 10 Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then really depending on what business says, I can see the kitchen always probably shutting down on 10.30 on the weekends, and then we like to, as a company, try to make last call within an hour after the kitchen shuts down and get everybody out of there before around 11.30, so... I would see it probably going down. That's how all of our other restaurants work. Mm -hmm. so Are you making any major modifications to the bar area? Uh, Design-wise, yes. Structurally, no. So the bar is probably going to remain the same size. The bar itself will get a major overhaul design-wise, but really won't be. Um, there'll be a pergola going over the top of the bar. It's designed. Uh, but as far as adding seats and you know major reconstruction of that area, it, the layout's going to be the same. And then the last thing is obviously the the uh, entrance and exit off of the location. Yes. That was one of the issues uh, late at night, so but it doesn't seem like we're going to have that issue. But the parking may become an issue. We have other tenants still in the building, I so, assume. So, yeah, I, I could it, – if it does, you know, I think we would have to – I don't know the best course of addressing that situation. I would assume it would deal talk with dealing with the landlord, uh, Jim Dimitri, and then the current tenants and seeing if we can – if possible, figure it out ourselves. And then um, if it did become a problem, I'd probably start to look for resources and recommendations and where we go yeah. from there. Just reach out to your neighbors because that uh, was at one some point there was an issue with 
overflow into your neighbor's operations where they were maybe closed, but they were not giving the freedom of using their parking spots, and okay. I don't want to see that turn in. Um, you know, if there would be some signage to help to just start that process, we'd be more than willing to put that in as far as parking. I do know that um, Jim had changed the entrance and exit of the, um, the, the, the flow of the parking lot. I don't know if that would have an effect to it. But um, all of our companies, we're more than willing to, we like to embed ourselves with the community, and we definitely don't want to upset any of our neighbors. So did you say Jim is going to change it, or is he considering it? I, from what I heard, he was planning on changing. I'm not exactly sure where. It's just the exit and entrance, the flow through. I don't know if that's something that he has to go through the board, and he has yet. I know that was in discussion, and yeah. he thought that would be a better flow. I believe that goes through CPC. Okay. So I, I, I can't speak to that. I, just, I don't know. I know that was... Uh, it was mentioned. I don't know where we okay. are with that. Any other questions on the board? Mrs. Minupelli? I just wanted to, I think you answered this to Mr. O'Leary, but you are starting construction in July? Be mid -week, so we close on the building in July, July 15th. I don't have a hard date of starting construction, but I would assume it would be within that week. And finishing it when? We would hope you get done between a month and a month and a half. So basically by mid-August, we was when we hope to be done mm -hmm. uh, you know obviously with a project like this you got to a, a account for some uh, delays so I really don't want to be doing construction past September who's your proposed manager for this establishment that we're looking at here restaurant manager yes so um, I'm the director of operations of the company so during the opening I'll be there most of the time we have hired a, a woman named Melissa Bucci who did work for Great American Tavern previously and is now already working with us uh, that we're training her up and she'll be our opening manager for our kitchen. Our executive chef Jay Duckley will be going in as the, uh, he has a similar role as I do as overseeing operations on the back of the house. And then Kyle Lewis, who's our kitchen manager at Joe Fish currently in North Reading, is most likely taking on the lead in the kitchen at the kitchen manager for that location. So do we have a designated manager? Because you are, are you at the other two establishments? I'm at the other well? three, so yeah, your designated ma manager would be Melissa. And, and are these, are these um, individuals TIP certified? So TIP certification will be part of the training program. So I, I believe she is because she opened up a Wahlburgers in Linfield. I believe that would come. Now, however, if she's not, she's slated to be get TIP certified before we open the doors. Our starting staff, our, our opening staff, part of that two week training will be a TIP certification course that we all go through. So those doors won't be open until everybody has gone through TIP certification, including our managers. Do you plan on doing a takeout business there as well? Uh, we always do takeout in our stores. You know, it's just kind of a, an add on. I'm not sure how much we would advertise that, but um, we would we always do takeout. So yes. He's looking for a drive through I think. <laughs> <laughs> and a takeout would just be food, obviously. It, obviously, yes. Mr. Yeah, Gilbert. <laughs> just a question to follow up on Selectwoman Minnie Pelly's question. So uh, on the application, we have under Category 8, manager contact. It identifies yourself as a manager. At the time I filled up the application, we didn't have a manager, so I put myself. And I can update that information. If I can send it to anybody, I can give you her contact. Well, there would need to be an approval for the, the change of manager. Okay, so here. is it possible, I mean, t for me to stay as the manager? Not or if you're not going to be there. Oh, I'm going to be there. I mean, with the new restaurant will be opening up, I will definitely. Well, this is the challenge we have with the American Tavern. We went through several managers okay. in the first year and a half, and it was getting a little tiresome to be coming back here and changing it and changing it. We'd like to see a steady, committed, dedicated manager because we know that means the operations being managed with someone that's in control of the operations, familiar with the operation, not having this complete turnover all the time. So I would suggest if you don't want, if it's not going to be you, is that what we were supposed to vote on this evening? It's the, yeah. ap the application designates That James we would Deets postpone second. this public hearing, or not postpone it, continue it and give you an opportunity to rethink this maybe yeah, I, would, I, would, you know, I would suggest that we, we approve it as, as submitted because the start up and probably through the end of the year you're going to be there and then come the renewal if there's going to be a change of manager just notify the board we'll do a change of manager hearing and you do the designation or if you do it sooner it's just so yeah formality. let me rephrase because um my role in a new restaurant 
is basically coming in as a GM here. I will have responsibilities in other stores, but I'm, I'm slated for 50 to 55 hours in this store for the foreseeable future. Um, so when we fill that application, you know, it's a new store we're running, I'm, I'm going to be there. And I, I, I'm going to be about 50, 55 hours minimum as we get the store up and running. And then a, a renewal at the end of the year for 2018, depending on, um, we're, we're grooming Melissa to be that GM. I could then add her to be there. But up until December, I mean, this is, this is, this is a new store has to run perfectly. I'm going to be there. Mr. Schultz. Yeah. Um, would holding off on approving this with a delay your closing? Uh, possibly, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't want to do it. I appreciate that. We'll do it I know. Yes, Ms. Was the um, individual that you expect to take over as the manager, was she a manager before that was approved by this board? Is that a... I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what... Um, she worked for Great American Tavern, and then she had left and went to Wahlburgers, and then she had come back, and then we kind of took her. I, I don't think she was prob... I don't know. No, she might have been one of your It's managers. definitely not her. I would assume that uh, Deborah another, was another probably one. the manager that yeah. was on file for. I you. think that's the one. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's Definitely, right. Because yeah. yeah. we would have to query check a proposed manager. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to go would, through an application yeah. process. Which you are aware that you have to get query checked. He filled out a form for it. He did, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He's been through this before. Boy, I hope there's no problem. Yes. Yeah. So that. I got a little. I mean, when you said, "Are you the manager opening?" and asked, I had another one. She's my support. I'm the lead on this project until until okay. this, this is up and running. I, I'm sorry for the confusion. So. Um, I am the lead on this project. This is my baby. I, I will be there. Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you, I believe, are the manager of record for Joe Fish in town here as well. No, uh, Judy Waters is the manager. So you are not. I am not. I'm on the license. Uh, I will. I'm the manager on the license. Okay, so th that was my question. You okay. On the, on, the, on the license issued to Joe Fish, you are the manager of record. Yes. Okay. Should that have been changed? Well, I, I guess my question would be, well, what is the? That's going to be the what's challenge. The, what's the plan okay. for this six-month period for your responsibilities to effectively address both establishments? Okay. Um, I would take your recommendation the best course. If, I mean, in the restaurant business. There's not a day goes by I'm not in one of my stores. You know, the, the industry calls for about 60 to 80 hours work week. I live eight miles from both of these locations. They're half a mile apart. Um, I'm in my stores every day. So let me run the scenario by yeah. you. Here we are, we're June, January 1st, 2018. Store's been open now six months, roughly, and things are going great. What are you going to do? Um, Hopefully count the money. Yeah, one of my I'm, I work on operations of the company. At that point, so I, I will probably look just to put a GM in place. Okay. And then, um, based off of what I'm hearing now, go through the proper channels to put her on that liquor license form, so that you guys have one contact that is there. I wouldn't put a GM in place that I think would not be in our company for two years, ideally, unless unless she had you know applied elsewhere but if you look at our, our managers they tend to stay for I mean, we've had managers with us for 15 years okay. so um, Mr. Gilbert. thank you mr. chairman would you be prepared to commit to the board that you would submit to the selectmen uh, on or about November 1st of this year an application for change of manager for either establishment Sure. Yes. And, and if not to do so because you're not concerned, you're not comfortable with the development of any employee involved, provide us an update. Sure. Definitely. You can be a manager of more than one license. You can. Yes. That's not illegal, and it's not uncommon, candidly. Yeah. And where these two locations are close by. And yeah, that's so why I'm not overly concerned about it. Yeah. Okay. Any anybody else? Anyone in the public would like to have a comment or? There's a motion. Just. Uh, um, First of all, you run a great operation. Thank already. you. You know, so we appreciate that. We appreciate your uh, maintaining an interest and in expanding here in North Reading, and wish you nothing but success. Well, so, thank you uh, for your support. Thank you very you much. You guys have always been generous to town um, events. We try to embed ourselves in the community. We definitely do. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Anybody would like to speak in favor? Speaking against? None. Not hearing any. I'm going to close the public hearing and turn it over to Mr. Schultz to make a 
a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to transfer the common victualler all alcohol <coughs> license held by Great American Tavern, LLC, DBA Great American Tavern, to Dos Lobos, LLC, 303 Main Street, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any more discussion? I just want to wish you the very best. And Thank we're you. We're very happy that you're making the commitment to continue to make uh, the restaurants improve along Route 28. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Best of luck. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Against? None? Unanimous. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have minutes. <coughs> Get back to the package. Does everybody have the minutes pulled up? And I'll turn it over to Mr. Schultz too. All right, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the May 22, 2017 open session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion. I have a second <coughs> discussion. This is what May 22nd? Yes. I will be abstaining. I was not present. Um. Okay. It says abstain, but it should say absent, right? Oh, uh, oh, it does. Uh, Close enough. Close. For me. It says absent. Sorry. Okay. Any other comments? None? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And one abstention. May 20, no, May 22nd executive session. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the May 22nd, 2017 executive session minutes as written. Second. By? Second. Second. By Mrs. Mignopelli. <coughs> Any more discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against or abstaining? Abstain. One abstention. The executive session minutes are May 23rd. I just want to comment, though. I guess you guys got out early when I wasn't here. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. We'll keep track of that. Yeah. That's a statistic we're going to show at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the May 23, 2017 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? None. Unanimous. June 1st, regular session minutes. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 1, 2017 open session minutes. Second, Second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. June 1st, 2017 executive session. Minutes. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 1, 2017 executive session minutes as written. Second. Second by Ms. Mignopelli. Any discussion? None. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. June 5, 2017, regular session minutes. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 5, 2017 open session minutes as written. Second. Second by Ms. Mignopelli. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Public comment. Anyone here for public comment? Mr. Walner, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, Rich Walner, 57 Lakeside Boulevard. Um, I was here on uh, 424. Um, at that time, uh, I was. Uh, we were starting to discuss the potential of a feasibility study of the town hall and fire department being on the town meeting warrant, the most recent one. Um, I raised other issues at the time to talk about the need for affordable housing for our seniors, talk about a potentially new intergenerational community center, and a new main street around the, the old stop and shop area. Um, at, and uh, we had a good open discussion about that, and at the end I was pleasantly surprised that um, you were more encouraged to hold off on the feasibility study and for us to uh, take a broader look at this area. Um, and so uh, I agreed at that time, we all agreed. I, I had a response from everybody that was favorable and including Andy Schultz texted me during, right after my presentation to say he had heard it on, on uh, the, the community center uh, video program and that he also was in agreement with the, what direction we were going in. 
so I was very pleased with that um, response. I've also seen since that time, especially at town meeting, there was a lot of more open discussions about the community center potentially being on the docket of things that we may want to look forward to doing. And um, I, I and heard some real strengths for potentially changing our economic development in that area as well. So it's fairly out in the open now. And my most recent um, uh, covering the booth at the town, uh, at the town uh, day by the chamber, um, I had a number of discussions with a number of people about this. And a lot of people were generally aware of what was going on. So it felt very good. I promised to come back immediately after town meeting to say, let's, let's move on. Let's get going. And that's why I'm here today. I don't want to take up much of your time. I know it's already late for you. Um, but I am, uh, would like to keep the discussion going and not lose time in the summer so that we are ready by October to have a feasibility study that includes fire station, town hall, and um, the intergenerational community center because they all work together. It'd be good to have all the information at the same time. I know the housing study is going forward. I think we're, we're going to, into open forum on that at the end of the month. And I just heard the draft the other day and that's it's hitting production plans, it's hitting a lot of things I was looking for for definitions so we know what affordable housing is all about. Um, and, uh, and I know I've talked to Danielle McKnight, our town planner, about what's going on with the, um, the package treatment plant down there. And she gave me some hurdles, but she also gave me some timelines for what's going on with that. So if we start to think on a bigger basis, oh, what we all agreed to, let's have a really good plan, right? Let's have a really open discussion about it. So if you really look at all the projects that are required to do the, any of these projects we're talking about, or even the Main Street, it's going to touch a lot of different departments. It's going to touch a lot of different people. We're talking elder services. We're talking town administrator. We're talking fire. We're talking uh, EDC, CPC, a number of different ones, finance, you know, all those different groups. So what I'm suggesting is that um, we put together an ad hoc committee. And I'd be happy to lead that, or we could assign somebody else to lead it, but that we get a group, maybe a representative from each of these groups, to jump in, create a task force, and start to look at this and start to create a plan during the summer so that we are prepared to move things along as fast as we can um, and not miss a beat in doing that. I mean, including narrowing the highway down, you know, from 12 feet to 10 feet per lane, that's going to require a lot of advanced planning, and we should be ready for that. And I don't really see how that's going to get done within any one committee. I think it has to be across, across discipline across the border in order to make that happen. So I'm suggesting that we, uh, we don't have to decide to do it tonight, but at some point, maybe somebody within the Board of Selectmen jumps in and becomes the liaison for this type of affair if we still support it. But let's find a way where we can create a group, make it across different departments. Let's get a you know, one or two from each of these departments to kind of be representation for it, and let's get this moving forward. And, you know, if you need my energy to make that happen, that'd be fine, I'd be happy to do that. I already have some people in line who are already working on my group, so it's already, some of it's already happening, um, but it'd be great to make this a more formal um, uh, task group, ad hoc, however you want to call it. And uh, we're happy to, you know, I'm happy to give that energy to make that happen. So that's my offer to you, and seeking feedback again i don't want to take up much of your time thinking we're all still embracing this a good plan is going to go a long ways and at some point we have to bring in uh you know the public of course and get their input as much as possible um and not have discussions at town meeting and rather have a really good concept plan and everything worked out ahead of time so i seek your feedback but i also seek your approval to go forward i will say that you know what you're talking about to me at least I think falls a little bit more under the CPC because they have been the one very active working with, um, on the MAPC study. And if they, I think it does make sense for them to build somewhat of a subcommittee to start exploring a little bit more in depth of how you would actually execute what's in that MAPC plan. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be preparing for October town meeting here relatively soon. And we're going to create a new warrant article to get back to the feasibility study. The board made a commitment that we would readdress it in October town meeting. And I'll make sure that you know when that's discussed on these agendas that you're aware of that, and that uh, we'd be welcoming your feedback. But I think the feasibility study is definitely a step. I know there's some discussions with the town administrator and myself, talking with the chief on their building. He's going through a little bit of internal review on 
type of building that he would want. I know you're doing some review with the seniors and working with Mrs. Perenni to look at requirements as well. So I think the first, those are the kind of sort of the two steps I think have to happen. I think CPC is, you should go and do the same thing at their meeting as well. Anybody else have any more feedback? If not, anybody else for public comment? Yeah. Come on up. I just want to say thank you. thank you for coming back and keeping it on the radar for yeah. us as well. It's, it's on our it's on our agenda to keep the economic development moving forward for sure. And this is another piece of you know getting yeah. things together for the community that I think is important to all of us to keep it to keep it on the radar. So yeah, keep as much as possible. Keep help is great this active participation is great okay so it sounds like you want me to go to cpc meetings is that what well you're i think you should you, i think that's the right spot to go to next is to go to their meeting and is in the, under their public comment and make the same uh, uh, request because you know that mapc study didn't come under the board of select when it came up under the yes. cpc correct and there is some really good stuff in there how feasible is it i'm not sure and there's a lot in there and then in regards to town buildings too how it plays into it and we have the master plan now that we're we got the funding for our town meeting that we have to include and capture a lot of this stuff in it again they're going to be spearheading that action so i think that's a really good place to start i'm the liaison i go to most of those meetings and i certainly would be the the right point of contact to continue this discussion but as i said when it comes to the feasibility study warrant article that's going to come out of here we're going to sponsor that, and we certainly welcome your review and participation on that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else for public comment? Yes, uh, Jeff, you're 427 Park Street. Uh, I've been working uh, closely here with him uh, on the uh, programs that he's looking to push, which are really uh, all inclusive for the community. Uh, and I think what he's hoping to accomplish here. Uh, and we as a committee are looking to, to accomplish is uh, uh, to keep a, a real open dialogue on this, on the, the multiple issues that are surrounding uh, the accomplishment of, of the downtown of, uh, of North Reading. I guess I'm calling it downtown. I don't know if that's going to be the name for it, but uh, that would be a nice idea. But, uh, you know, keeping the open dialogue, not only with the Board of Selectmen, the CPC, and other committees that that will kind of weave their way into it. So it's going to be a, you know, a long, active process, but uh, I think we're looking forward uh, to working with you and, and really accomplishing something unique for the town. Thank you. Mrs. Mullen? Rita Mullen, 29 Abbott Road. Just wanted to remind everybody that this Wednesday is the 20th anniversary of Ipswich River Park. So it's going to be kind of a fun celebration down from 5 to 8 o'clock at Ipswich River. Uh, and we're going to bring back some of the old timers, uh, L LUC people, Hillview pe members, the selectmen uh, that were all around when this started. I want to thank Recreation, uh, Maureen Stevens, uh, Maria Brown, uh, Lynn Clements, Marty Tilton, for all the work that they've done to get this ready for everybody. And uh, again, to uh, congratulate Marty Tilton for making Ipswich River Park look better today than it did 20 years ago. Brad, Ta uh, Brad Jones will be there, and I'm still waiting here for Mr. Ty just for opening ceremonies. But we're not going to drag on that night. It's going to be quick. We're going to have a lot of uh, raffle. Every 20 minutes, we're going to have raffles, shooting T-shirts and a wonderful petting zoo, not a little one, a big one there, and a, a lot of entertainment. So I hope those in the town that have young children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and parents, elderly, will have chairs for you, Steve, uh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we hope you can all come. Thank you very much. Zebo, you Rita, said. Before yes. you run, yeah. I have on my calendar at five o'clock. Are you asking me to talk longer? On <laughs> occasion. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rita, is it? Opening at 5 o'clock? The, the speakers will start at 6, but the uh, children's entertainment starts at 5 o'clock. So we'll stick to a, and the prices are going to be back uh, 20 years ago. 
you know, a dollar for hot dogs, two dollars for burgers, like half the price of what it normally is. Uh, no price, no charge for the pricing this year for the parking or anything like that. So, just going to be a fun, fun day, night. Five Thank to you. eight, you said. Thank you. So it's been a quick twenty years, right? It's been a quick twenty years. It's been a quick twenty years. Mr. Gilbert. No, no charge. This no charge. This Wednesday. Only this Wednesday. After Wednesday. after that, <laughs> we're going to. Five to eight, you said. At Five the to gazebo? eight, and speakers will start at six o'clock at the gazebo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any mm, anyone else for public comment? All right. I think we broke a record on public comment tonight. Um, next subject. It's something I asked to put on the agenda. There's a new state law in how we sign the warrants. Right now, all five of us, at least three of us, have to sign the warrants each week, spending and payroll. And under this new law, we can designate one person to do it, so it doesn't have to. They don't have to wait for three signatures anymore. Um, it's not something that I'm saying we have to do. I'm bringing it up for the board just to make you aware of it. Maybe some of you didn't know this law. I just learned about it myself. And if it's something that we're interested in considering assigning one person to sign the payroll and vendor warrants each week and then assign a backup designee, in their case, they are out of town or incapacitated to sign. I bring it up for discussion unless Mr. Cabrera you want to add anything before. Uh, Note that uh, you described I think, adequately what the change in law was. It was a result of the municipal modernization bill from last legislative session. Um, it allows for the designation of the primary and secondary designee and, um, and requires that the board establish a procedure by which the secondary designee would sign on behalf of the primary design designee. And that's at the board's determination. Anyone? I think it makes all so the sense I, in the world. I would have a question for the time minister. Go right ahead, Mr. Masseri. What I don't know, maybe this is a finance director question, is if you look at uh, current practice, right, there are days that only three signatures are on there, et cetera, and they vary as a function of, you know, board, board members working, doing things they don't get to it, they miss the email. Uh, so it seems to me that getting three signatures might be better than having a single member or even a backup deal with it. Because I, I think if you go down that route, uh, then those are the only two people that can sign the warrant. No one else can, right? Is that correct? That's yes. my interpretation of it. That, that, that's my understanding. So, that there would be a primary designee. I mean, maybe maybe if we had more information as to what goes on on a weekly basis in terms of getting the signatures, we could make that decision. Mr. Gilbert. Through you, Mr. Chairman, are you asking for a report card? <laughs> <laughs> what? No, I didn't you were asking for a report card. <laughs> well, no, I'm just trying to, you know, it's an interesting change. And at the same time, it could create more problems depending on, you know, the history of any one of us signing it off every single week. I mean, through you, Mr. Chairman, I think it really comes down to the determination of the board yeah. as to how it uh, wants to make the resource available to sign the warrant. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can tell you that the instances where the obtaining the third signature has been problematic, uh, they do come up. Uh, you know, is it often? I wouldn't say it's often, but they do come up in instances, and it's particularly problematic at times when there's vacations or otherwise going on. But, you know, I think this is really for the board to determine how it wants to make the authority available to sign the warrant. Well, it just reduces the issue that you're bringing up. I mean, having one designee and a secondary in the case that the designee can't do it just makes it way more efficient. Doesn't mean, though, they can't look at the warrants. That's they still have the same. rights to look at them. we all still get copies of it? Oh, yeah. The, the law requires that there be a report to the selectmen, yeah. the board, at the next regular meeting. Um, you know, just an initial conversation with the chairman, my suggestion was you know, for public purposes, we could report the amount of the payroll and vendor warrants approved and then certainly include in the meeting packet the detail as you see it right now when you're asked to sign it. Right. Again, I bring it up as just an efficiency that for your consideration. We don't even need to vote on it tonight. We can bring it up at the meeting in July. You can think about it, read, go online, read about the law. I'm not looking for a decision tonight unless we had you know, unanimous 
support for. I think it makes all sense in the world. It kind of modernizes our approach. I know it's tough. I'll be like on the road on a Thursday. I know it's coming in or, you know, you're trying to scramble to, to go to a Wi-Fi thing so your iPad can boot up. And I think this is much more efficient given that some of us have obligations during the day too. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I thought once you got three, that's all you needed. But right. nevertheless, we still could all review it. And the time that the normal three that sign it, these three guys that normally sign it, um, that one of you wasn't there, I would get an alert from Liz saying, make sure you sign it. So, but that's happened, I think, all of twice because you're all always on your, you know, checking it out. So would, we, we, we should, we're required to get a copy of it every week anyway and review yeah. it. Um, it's gotten a lot better because it's electronic. Obviously. Exactly, because, right. Know, Makes it much easier. I was waiting in the doctor's office. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they changed the law for a reason. It's just to try to add some efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if we're not interested in it, I'm okay with moving on and leaving it the way it is. I don't have a problem. See, to, to me, if we were going to do it, to me, I would just designate the chair and the vice chair to be the designee in the backup. You know, the signature on the... Yeah. It, that way, everybody yeah. knows who's supposed to do it. But uh, you know, I haven't gotten any phone calls recently. You know, once mm -hmm. in a while when I didn't get to it, you know, Karen would call and say, "Hey, are you around?" And it, it was even worse when we used to have to come in and sign it. Right. Uh, oh no, God. But uh, but even so, there there have been occasions when she's called and I didn't get to do it electronically, and then they said I haven't checked emails mm -hmm. for those deals. And, mm -hmm. But then you just do it. So the electronic has helped. I mean, it's very efficient now anyway. Uh, it, it, I don't disagree. I mean, I go on sometimes, and there may already be three there. Mm -hmm. so, but it's fine. I sign it anyway. I'm never yeah. first. Many times you're first. always oh, first. <laughs> you're cowboy. So, like. Not necessarily. I, I think to Bob's point, it could, it could create, well, it creates more of a problem for the individuals who are designated. Let's put it that way, as far as the responsibility. And not knowing that there's a, there has to be communication for backup, yeah. and then there's also reporting to the board members the following meeting. You know, is what the law is requiring now. If you if you adopt this, whereas currently we all have access to it immediately. I mean, this sends it to us anyway. Uh, the payrolls, and then we I'm wouldn't be we wouldn't be getting we anyway. wouldn't be getting the invoices now. We wouldn't be getting the documents that that were signed until afterwards because it wouldn't be attached to. So you know, unless yeah, you and, and if you have email on your phone, then. Uh, It's not a big deal. Everyone typically has a phone with them all the time. Tell you what, for the sake of saving some time, I'm going to put it on the J July agenda and we can make a decision then. Okay. It, 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 see what Liz is more comfortable with. Right. I think we've ran it by her, and I don't think she had an objection. I don't think she has, she has a preference. No. I don't think she has an objection to it. As long as she has a preference, guarantee that the signatures get on it. She likes the idea that you know now she only has to worry about one person getting it done, and as long as they know they got to get it done, and they're going to yeah. get it done, it doesn't hold anything up. And I'm pretty good about it. I keep my electronic media pretty close to me, so you know, I'll be the uh, primary. And Kate would be the secondary, and we talked about it, and we don't see any challenges. And again, it's all, it's not to have control over it; it's to try to create efficiencies, where you know, it just takes another thing off your plate. But if you want to do it, and you guys want to continue, I'm fine with it. I'm signing it anyway. Either way, for me, don't. There's no change. I'm trying to just relieve some. The new law came out. I mentioned it to Michael. He looked into it. Thought it was something worthy of a discussion. Mm -hmm. If it there's some to be apprehension at all, I'd rather not do it. Honestly. It happens to be one of the least time consuming tasks as a board member. Maybe for you, it. Bob. What? Maybe for you. You know. Maybe for others it's a little more challenging. I don't know. It doesn't take long it's when it comes out. I could be in a trial all day and it comes on your you know, in the middle of the day on a Thursday. Yeah. It's like I can't get to a white you know. Oh. Yeah, that's all. Because I just have it on the iPad, so. Yeah. Yeah. Some people you need to get up to date. You, know? you, can, you can have the town email forwarded <laughs> to your email account. I'm going to request that. Yeah, yeah but right. in a court yeah. house, you can't even have electronic media, can you? What's yes, that? You can. You can. Yeah. Yeah, certain courts, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's. Um, but you're not checking your Let's sleep on it. No. You're on Do you have the liaison assignments, Mike, for the board, or we don't need it? 
you have it up in the. Um, you weren't planning on it, right? We don't need it. It's okay. You can probably bring it up from your email if you wanted to. Unless the board members want to, we can just go over it. Liaison. Yes. Did I miss one? You, you get oh, sorry. Way, way, you get commission on this. Well, I'm way ahead of myself, huh? Yeah. You know why? I wrote, I wrote all my notes from our RMLD right over all this. Uh, sorry. Yes. Update on the MWRA Reading and Andover Water discussion. Thank you. There's been a lot of going on. <laughs> well, I haven't slept much. So I apologize for that. So yeah, tell us what's going on. You guys had a so meeting in, today. So in the packet there is a uh, document, a single page, that was presented to us today. Today. Well, there's two documents. The, You're talking about the IMA one, from right? From the town manager of Andover, there's a bullet proposal on what they would propose. To supply water to us and to increase the water supply to meet our needs. <clears throat> so and we, we can go through each one of the items just for information and if there are any questions. Well, first of all, we, we've had two meetings. We've had several meetings. Yeah. Oh, we've had, several, we've had meetings. several meetings this week already. Um, MWRA, Reading, uh, with Reading yes. representatives and our consultants. Yeah, uh, yeah, job progress meeting with the consultants as well. Job progress meetings with the consultants as well. Uh, MWRA stuff is uh, moving forward. Um, the fly in the ointment that's on the horizon is what's happening in Stoneham as far as uh, the MWRA project moving forward, progressing there. Seems to be a little bit of delay there, which could impact um, us. A little bit, but uh, town administrators have been corresponding with uh, Fred Lasky on that, and we're getting a better handle on it. But everything else, uh, since the appropriation, again, I'd like to acknowledge town meeting and town meeting's actions on uh, on uh, the appropriation that took place uh, last week, because that was a huge step forward to uh, ensuring that we have adequate water. Uh, in the meantime, and over as. Uh, resurrected their interest in, in supplying us. And what Mr. Masseri said today has uh, provided us with an outline uh, with some bullet points and salient points that they want us to consider. And um, we have another meeting scheduled for Thursday afternoon. Uh, we, so Bob and I and the town administrator are looking for some sort of consensus from the remainder of the board members as to whether or not you wish us to continue to have discussions with Andover in relation to what's been uh, suggested here. Uh, it would appear as though it certainly is, uh, takes a good, it, would, it behooves us to take a good solid look at it and uh, consider it and try and uh, address some of the concerns that we have in relation to uh, long-term uh, renewals and uh, what they're proposing and what we would be looking to get in comparison to what we get with MWRA, which is, you know, basically we don't talk about for over 100 years or more. Uh, Again, they proposed some terms which are substantial in timelines. Uh, economically, it seems to something that we should be taking a good close look at. And then um, Bob and I started to express some of the nuances that the, the board would certainly be uh, overly concerned with in relation to any type of an agreement with them. But uh, we have another meeting scheduled for Thursday afternoon, and we're just looking for permission to continue those those discussions and uh, I think from a due diligence standpoint I think we have an obligation to do so personally but uh, if you have any suggestions for us in relation to what's been proposed or comments you know Bob and I are available and the town administrator to take those uh, individually from you and uh, certainly give you an update after our meeting on Thursday if you wish for us to proceed forward with Andover. Well, I think it would be helpful just because, Andrew, you're new to the mm -hmm. board, just to summarize how we got where we are, okay? And, um, and we started back in, I believe it was August of 2014. Prior to that, we started discussions because our I, IMA, IMA with Andover was coming to an end. And so we started to have our discussions, and they went very long, many year, a few years. And in August of 2014, tell me if I'm wrong on the dates, we got a letter 
from the DPW director stating that they could not meet the demands and the requests that we have for our, our water demand, and which led us down this path to seek an alternative quality water source. And that's how we ended up with MWRA. And that's, and that's how we ended up with the five-year agreement that we have with Andover. The, the, the original intermunicipal agreement uh, was signed back around 1990, 1991. Uh, with Andover and required special legislation, an interbasin transfer of water from the Merrimack River Valley into Ipswich River. So all of that was done back in 1990, 1991. And we've had a great relationship with the town of Andover uh, to date, a uh, couple little glitches. Uh, but then it came down to, as we were looking forward and looking towards, um, again, spending an inordinate amount of, amount of money on our own wells, which was only supplying about, what, 35% of our, our water, uh, we were looking for other alternatives to than to having our own wells uh, produced because we're spending a lot of money for just a little bit of water. Uh, so we approached the Andover, and again, we're looking for future growth, and potentially what we would need. And uh, during the course of several years, discussions with them and trying to, uh, and the, the, intermunicipal, the intermunicipal agreement had already expired, so we, we, they were looking to renegotiate the terms also. Uh, we were looking long term, and I think, as Mr. Briscoe pointed out, uh, we were informed that they were unable or unwilling or unable to uh, meet our needs, which forced us to look somewhere else. Uh, the other alternatives were, again, uh, MWRA was pretty much it. And again, we've expended you know, obviously over a million dollars uh, moving forward, and town meeting again approved the, uh, the appropriations uh, the other night to go full steam ahead with the construction. In the meantime, we've had a lot of good discussions with the town of Reading, MWRA, very cooperative, and it appears to be, you know, it is a viable source. It is our only source at this particular point in time. In the meantime, since 2014 and to date, Andover um, has looked at uh, what their capacity is to uh, deliver, what their capacity is to draw from the Merrimack River, and there's been some uh, change in, in uh, their determination as to whether they could and would be willing and want to provide us. And, uh, as a result of their comments to the FEIR or DEIR? DEIR, DEIR, um, really opened up the discussions again with them. So uh, we just started recently having discussions in earnest with them. Uh, today they made a presentation to us with some bullet points uh, to give us something to, to think about and talk about. It looks like something that we should really be looking at and considering you know, before we um, start spending a, you know, thousands or millions of dollars uh, going forward. If it's viable, let's take a look at it. And uh, you know, my suggestion to the board is uh, allow Mr. Masseri, myself, and the town administrator to continue the, the discussions, to uh, hone it in a little bit more tightly and uh, see if we can come to some sort of a a presentation for the board at a later date and determine whether or not this is what we're going to do. And again, we, our timeline is tight. Um, we're we not looking. We have made Andover quite quite clear to Andover that we are proceeding with the MWRA route. You know, we're on schedule. We have a schedule, which is coincides with the intermunicipal agreement with them. They understand that. Um, and they, too, are willing to talk a lot in a short period of time uh, to see if there's any... Uh, opportunities, mutual opportunities between the two communities to continue our relationship. So uh, I think we have a fiduciary responsibility to do so. I think uh, they've offered us something that, you know, might be a, um, a, a viable solution that uh, so we can make an informed decision. I think we should continue the, uh, the discussions with them. I think we, well, defer, I, we defer to the majority of the board. Well, I have to say, I, I certainly don't have the confidence you do. I went back and watched the meeting that Mr. Masseri asked me to go back and look at. Mm -hmm. and I got to tell you, the body language and the tone and the pace of that meeting didn't really see any urgency or any real true want to do this. I, you must be seeing something different. We than did, what no, I we, we did we see something change, very different today. Definite change. So today. We saw well, something very different today. You were in the room with two individuals of a board of five, so which is concerning. Well, they, they had two board members there today. Yeah. And, and one of them had raised a bunch of questions, the new board member. She had a totally different view because she now got a better understanding of what they could do and can't do. 
But this is the challenge, Mr. Misery. It's now, what are we here? Uh, we're in June, uh, going into July of 2017. We'll pass three years now. Three years have passed. We have put a tremendous amount of attention onto this finding this quality water source for our town to protect our town. And I don't disagree. We do have a fiduciary responsibility. That is our job. But at the same time, we had they sent us down a path for one. We had one option, and that's the path it looks like we have taken, especially going into town meeting. And we've spent a tremendous amount of money. We're planning to spend a tremendous amount of money, but it's a guarantee quality water source. I'm not getting that sense, and I read what you guys sent, and I haven't had quite time to go over this MWRA comparison, but i got to tell you, that worries me more than anything because I don't believe anything in it. No disrespect. I don't believe it. I don't. I think the numbers are not. I suggest that we give that to MWRA and let them look at your comparison. I'd like us to get their feedback on it. I'm not so sure they're going to agree with what you wrote in there. I don't think we're working with real well, numbers than, here. Other than the numbers that we're working with with the MWRA are the historical numbers and the numbers that they've given us in relation to what the annual increases are oh. potentially to be. I'd like I mean, to get so a those are their that. numbers. And then these are the numbers, the other numbers are the numbers that Andover gave us and are willing to sign an agreement on. I cannot so, believe it. I know. It doesn't Isn't make it any something? sense. No, that's why it's, that's why it's, I think we have it's to unbelievable, to be honest with you. And I, right. I just can't believe it's true. And I, I don't, it just seems we're going down a path that, you know, I went and read your little comments here on the, on the IMA. You know, I don't even understand the, what that is. By the way, these aren't ours. This is what was handed to us. We have not responded. Okay. Other than saying thank you very much, we'll yeah. take a look at it and we'll see you Thursday afternoon. Well, I'm not sold at all. But Mr. Be, being new, and I, I did remember seeing the photo of you guys at the town line shaking hands in the transcript for the two, three years back. Um, it seems to me, again, I'm you know new and on the outside looking in some respects on this. As we d develop our commercial base, we're going to need more water, obviously. I think the Guavin Reservoir is a much greater source of water and long-term source than Haggett's Pond. It's not Haggett's. No, it's not Haggett's. It's okay. no, it's but the, the Merrimack River. river. Actually, actually, the source of the Merrimack River exceeds right. Guavin's. But what I'm concerned about is, and again, you guys would be able to speak this better than I can, why all of a sudden is the pencil being sharpened with both the, the amount that they can give us and the price? Where, I mean, where well, was there's, this? There's, there's a couple of things here. Yeah. One is they've had a change in management. They have a new town administrator. Two is that they finally come to the realization that we supply, you know, we take from them 20, 25% of the water. Or the revenue. The revenue. That's, that's revenue. what I'm getting 12 at. 12% yeah. of the water. So they've woken up to the, the point that uh, if that goes away, that's going to be a big burden on their water rate. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's my point is right. they let us go so far down the line with how much have we invest, invested in NWRA just between buying the property in Mill Street, everything we've done and in a town meeting, and all of a sudden now, it, it just seems suspect to me that all of a sudden now the volume is there and the rates are, are more in line. I mean, it, it, I wish we would have known that three years ago, I guess. That's, no, I understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's clearly. Yeah. It, right. They, but they've, they changed, the, they've yeah. changed the tone and they've, they've looked at the uh, what they need. They claim they have enough water to supply our needs and theirs. And going to the future, they can get more water because there are no real restrictions on increasing what they take out of the Merrimack River. So there's a lot of things making sense. If you look at the capital investment going down the path of Andover, and by the way, I'm not trying to sell everybody on it. We're just talking about do we have to take it to the next step to make a final decision. And that has to be done quite quickly because town meetings approve the, the beginning of the expenditures for the MWRA mm -hmm. project, and as soon as we go out and start spending that money, it's all over. I think Andover's got that message now. The other issue with that, too, is though, how would this affect, well, let's say, and I agree, I think we should all do our due diligence, so I don't disagree with that, but I think one of the priorities we have right now as a board is somehow getting sewers down Conquer Street. If we all of a sudden get our water supply through Andover, how is that going to affect that project? Well, the interesting thing is if we go forward with the water on Andover, uh, to Andover we have a, a better timeline on getting sewer to Greater Lawrence. Yeah, but that's not on Concord Street. No, no, no. Yeah. Maybe. It's wherever we put it. It could be. 
Could be. Could, no, it could be. Again, oh, you bring up a good point. All I'm saying is, where was this five years ago? That's my only point. Is, Hold on. I, it Mr. wasn't Schultz. five years ago. Right. We, we know that. Hold on. I'm, <laughs> Mrs. Minupelli would like an opportunity to speak. I, th I don't think it's, I don't actually think it's harmful other than your time being taken to continue discussions. And I understand that this is sort of bullet points. It's not a formalized agreement. But my thoughts on everything that's been discussed is it's not a permanent solution. It's a 50-year solution, and it's terminable with a five years notice by either side. So the, no, those items obviously are not acceptable to Steve or I or the town. And those were expressed. And, and, and those are clearly, yeah. as they've stated, negotiable items. And then the other. Um, the other thing is, again, it's, it's your time being expended to kind of go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, which is a quite a bit of time in these meetings. And they know where we're at in our process. So s something of a, a better commitment, I think, is warranted at this point, at this stage in the game for us. But I do appreciate the efforts because I think it is important for us to continue those efforts without interrupting what we're doing. I mean, we're basing our water rates on what we're doing. It would be wonderful for us to get, to be able to get into the Greater Lawrence Seward, but that's not the commitment that's being made here. And I know that's another issue for, for what you're taking back to them as well, but it's clearly not. It's they'll look into it. And I, I understand this isn't no, by no means firm with them, but I also think that um, there's less of it for, there's less, uh, less, less pros than, than, no, there's more <laughs> cons than pros here. And then the other issue is we don't have, we just get the water. We provide everything else, our water, People do everything else, maintenance, supply, et cetera. And this immediately would require us to invest capital in their water system so that they can provide us up to the, that uh, million gallons per day that they're talking about here. So it, it's a million and a quarter that we would have to give them to improve their water system. Which is system. far less than we give the town of Reading to supply water to us. Well, we're we're well, upgrading we, our own infrastructure in order we're to do that. More, we're, 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 doing we're accessing more, we're doing more upgrading liquid. infrastructure in Reading than we are right. here. And by the we're way, by Steve well, and I and the town administrator and uh, DPW well, director and <laughs> well, Mark, Mark and uh, you know have been, you know, and our consultant are working just as hard on the MWRA. Oh yeah. In the meeting and it's clear as we meet with the. Uh, the various people, and we met with Reading, as Steve mentioned, just last week, and uh, we find that there are issues there that and challenges that we have to stay on target to to, be, to meet our schedule too. Okay. We got to go under railroad here's, here's tracks. The we got to get under a uh, water across the the bridge on Mill Street, and that has its own set of challenges. My, but my point was just to say that I think, and I think probably all five of us are concerned at how real this sort of presentation is at this point. And um, that's the issue, I think. And I would, I would want you to. are asking for, yeah. a, to, you know, if, if the board is against it, there's no sense us wasting any more time. We feel strongly that it's certainly worth mm -hmm. meeting with them one more time and then yeah. you see where that goes. So Mr. Masseri, you mentioned this uh, issue with the Quabbin uh, over in Stoneham. Uh, what's what's okay, the potential the issue the and line, what's the potential the delay? The Stoneham connection, Michael, was to provide the worst case situation to feed yes. enough water through Reading to supply us in a peak situation, right? The current connection that's there is adequate to supply our regular daily use. It just doesn't cover the peak, which would require, if it's delayed late, to leave our wells running to take care of that peak. Mark, correct Mr. me if Mr. I'm Mr. Gilberto, do you, you wanted to comment on that? I, no, that's exactly what I was going to say. The, the timeline was for that connection to address our MAC, which is necessary to address our 
peak or maximum daily demand. But they're addressing it. Well, it, it was it was scheduled to be constructed on or about July first. Uh, yeah, that's where we came up with the July first, two thousand nineteen date for the intermunicipal agreement with Andover. It was based upon the MWRA's timeline to produce and deliver mm -hmm. the maximum capacity required in the worst base case scenario. That timeline has now slipped. True. Okay, period. Mm -hmm. Apparently, has slipped. And then so what's the date, Mr. Gilbert? If you go back to Stoneham, that underground water tank is done. They're finishing up the outside, putting a field over it, and all this kind of stuff, fixing the road behind the hospital. Their issue is getting all of the plumbing through Stoneham, which is going zigzag through side streets to get it to the Reading line to make that second connection. And that's the piece that is running behind the original schedule. Michael, do you want to make a comment? Yes. So I've spoken with the, but by email with the executive director of the MWRA. And while the work on that particular project, which would address our maximum daily demand days, is a bit delayed in Stoneham, they are forecasting a completion of September 2019. And what I reported back is subject to the regulatory approval. Our plan would be most likely to use our wells to bridge the gap on those maximum daily demand days, or secondarily, to use our existing water so uh, source from the town of Andover, if necessary, to bridge the gap subject to any agreement with them. That's a less likely scenario. Uh, the wells are available to us now. Uh, we may need to phase the permitting to make that happen, but there are avenues to resolve that issue right. in that period of time. So I guess I'm going to make this really easy for you. I'm looking for a solution that any future board member that sits here doesn't have to be addressed, have to address this issue ever again. And what we have presented from Andover, they will be faced with it every five years. And so hopefully you can get past that hurdle. And the second thing is, storage is very vital to the long term health of this town as well. And if we're going to get serious about this, then they, they better put something in paper and writing and we need to probably get the greater Lawrence Store district folks involved and maybe the mayor as well and we need to pick the pace up on this because right now our town has supported us thus far we went to October town meeting went to June town meeting and we collected money on every one of those town meetings and meetings prior to that as well you know, if we're gonna pivot we need that they I hope they're listening it needs to be like yesterday because if we go any further than another three or four weeks, I can tell you I'm not going to support it because I don't believe it already. And they're going to have a lot of convincing to do for me in the next three or four weeks. And we owe it to Reading and MWRA to be honest and open with them on what it is we're trying to do here. They've put a lot of their time and effort into this, and I want to thank them because, you know, without them we wouldn't have a source. And I don't want to see that get spoiled. And the governor as well, and Representative Jones, have gone to bat for us on a couple of things as you're well aware of and I don't want to see us uh, have some ill will over this as well. There's a lot of political ramifications going to come from this. You know, we, uh, so you, you better yeah, make yeah, sure we, we get it right. We've made it clear with, with representatives of Reading and consultants and MWRA that you know, we're, we're still, and with Andover, that we're still having, heading full steam ahead with MWRA. Uh, we've let the uh, Reading people know that uh, you know, and they're aware that Andover has approached us and we told them that we we're going to see what they had to say, certainly. Uh, but uh, we expressed to Reading that uh, this board's current position hasn't changed. So, you know, unless there's something that forces us to uh, pivot, as you say. Uh, and, you know, because they raise those questions on the DEIR, and we have to respond as part of closing out on the FEIR. Yeah. But the fictitious the response to all of this. So. It's just frustrating. I mean, you guys have working on this problem for how long? All of a sudden, now this shows up. It's uh, like, I, I, I got on 1988. Well, you signed an agreement in 1990. Yeah. You know, precisely. So, Mrs. Minupelli, and then we can move on. I, I just want to ask what, uh, what stage? Because we have to decommission our wells in order. Well, that was part of our entire plan. At what stage are we at with decommissioning our? And we wouldn't. Be I think able to it do started that, the presentation right? 2020. And, but we would ha keep those available as a secondary or? Our plan is not to do that. With the MWRA, but with Andover, we would, we would. No. Yeah, either one. Neither way. Neither okay. way. Yeah. 
We're not required. That, that's not our desire. And because I, we have yeah, to. Yeah, there are two issues with the wells. One was that we'd have to spend a ton of money to bring them back up to the million gallon limit that we have and taking water out of the ground. And then we face going forward, depending on what goes on with the Ipswich River, someone attacking our grandfathered amount, which could happen too. So, uh, and investing all that money that might only last us for, you know, the 10 or 20 years doesn't seem to make a lot of and sense. The, and the, the capacity that we're able to draw out of our wells, even when they're the money that we would need to spend on them, might not doesn't, ever get doesn't to warrant, uh, economically it doesn't make sense. No, I was just inquiring because if there is some sort of a delay that, we are predicting, or it, it, it's it's a tight timeline. It sounds like, but if there's some sort of a delay, what would we do in the interim? If well, we let's say clear, let's say we're going down the path of MWRA and we run into a delay, and we go to Andover and we say, hey, "We want to keep buying water for you for the next year." Right? You think they're going to say no? I doubt it, because it's it's money. It's money. Okay. Any more discussion on this? Mr. Gilberto. Just one comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank I, I you. know that the numbers that were on paper in the meeting folder are, are big numbers to look at, projected over a 30 or 40 year period. Um, the one comment I will offer is that I can assure you that the projections are based on the very same numbers that we use to develop this model for rate increases in fiscal year 2015 mm -hmm. and 2016, as well as the cost comparisons that we used in 2015 when looking to go down the path of the MWRA. So okay. that was the basis for developing this. I want to thank Mark for your efforts in putting it together. Um, they are big numbers. You're looking at $83 million swing over 30 years. That's a lot to manage, and obviously. I just don't believe the numbers. I'm the, sorry. The, ba the basis is. Kind of convinced me it's going to be tough. The, the basis of the numbers is what was utilized during the original comparison that led us down the path of the MWRA in 2014, 2015. And I would certainly expect to see that Andover is going to schedule meetings probably every week for the next three weeks or, four or so to try to wrap this up. What's their plan? It, it depends on our reaction. I mean, they're waiting to see if we're truly interested in talking with them and talking, talking terms and conditions. Um, well, they are well aware that, you know, that we don't want to have future boards here or our ratepayers here, you know, subject to the whims of a board up there. And conversely, they don't necessarily want to have the same situation with that to deal with who's ever sitting here, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, yeah. 50 years down the road either. Because we'd rather have an agreement that everybody agrees on and there's the deal and it's long term. You know, their initial uh, blush at this, you know, uh, gives us something to look at, but we already expressed it's uh, not acceptable. Uh, we don't see that as a, as a viable solution. And we, we questioned uh, the one thing about the five-year notification, that sort of a thing, right off the bat. And they just said, well, that's, you know, the, don't get overly concerned with it. Uh, so yes. anyway, just okay. one, one more quick thing, and I was wondering if this came up in terms of that. I re at the meeting that the TA and Bob and I went to from the month prior, it was a discussion, and this appears to contemplate um, it would need the home rule because of the term. So why did the 99 year get off the table and it became 50 and then? I, I think it was, a, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was at the advice of some council that they were talking. Oh, some attorneys okay. recommended this with an, out, with an out clause for both, it would be for both parties. And I said, well, we appreciate you looking out for our interests, but <laughs> we'll look out for our interests. And, uh, okay. and, but they said they, they were not hung up on that. Oh, okay. They were not hung up on it. So I think it was on the advice of counsel that they couched it that way. Um, but they know already that that's a non-starter for us. And, and yes, this would require a home rule petition, um, again, approval through the legislature. And uh, they're prepared to call a special town meeting uh, to get authorization to do so. Uh, it appears as though we're going to need some sort of authorization, even on the Reading deal, because of uh, potential wetland crossings and conservation and easements. So that's going to require some sort of special legislation, too, no matter which way we go. 
but um, okay all right I sounds like we'd like you to continue but yeah I the think meat the, is really I, coming I, on I think the yeah. board members that are not in direct contact on the MWRA project I mean we, we've been now meeting very regularly and intend to continue with our consultant on this MWRA portion of the project Have to they make been sure be, you know one of the things you know we we put in the budget for June town meeting we knew that we might make adjustments in October I don't want to be in a position of making and I don't think any one of you do making adjustments in October and then find out two or three months later we need to make other adjustments so it's important that all of the hurdles are identified on the Reading side going down that route and that we understand clearly uh, that uh, if we have to make adjustments to the budget which we knew we probably would as we get closer here that it's done in October town meeting or if it has to be delayed that we don't go through this twice two more times it doesn't make sense so I so think then you lose credibility with it. so there's a lot going on on both fronts right now yes there is all positive though I look at all oh, this is positive yeah, yeah. you know so. And I know Mayor Rivera is very interested in us joining the GLSD. Yeah, he is. I and, and the, to uh, the DPW it. director in Andover actually sits on the board up there and didn't disagree. And um, yeah. so, okay. So the, this uh, it's sort of a carrot that they're using too. Yeah. I don't have time to. Eat. No. But anyway, nibble on carrots. So we'll be meeting, and I guess Thursday afternoon. Next agenda item. Let's reappoint the Commission on Disabilities, please. Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend the following individual for reappointment to the Commission on Disabilities for a three uh, for a term to expire December 31, 2019. Michael Jeffrey and Scannell of 44 Burroughs Road. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. And any discussion on the appointment? None. Okay. Since it's uh, one individual, we don't have to do a roll call, right? We do? Okay. Let me go back. Mr. O'Leary. Hi. Uh, Mr. Scannell. Scannell. Yes. Mr. Masseri. Mr. Scannell. Mr. Scannell. Ms. Vignapelli. Mr. Scannell. And the chair votes Michael Scannell. Done. Okay, next subject is the liaison assignments. If you look in the meeting packet, this is updated. I put this in here today. Uh, the only update from what you, I had sent you previously is line item 13. I added the Merrimack Valley Regional Transportation Authority. I will be the board's liaison to that and a voting member um, until something changes. But I'm excited to have that on there, and I think we got a great response and support from the community at the town meeting, and uh, we look forward to continue to get that in place here relatively soon. So everybody had a chance to go through the liaison assignments. I tried to take people's strengths and assign them to where I think it would best fit and may make some change. There was nothing, nothing personal with any of this. It was just really all experience-based and changing up a little bit. Does anybody have any questions or Concerns or anything you want to discuss in regards to this liaison list? Good question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, have the, all the groups been notified with their liaison is yet? Not until we have this meeting. Okay, so make sure. Once you, once we have this meeting, and I get the feedback, and I don't have any issues or from anyone, uh, I will release it to the town administrator for publication. I believe that's the next step. And right, then, I think we normally communicate with the, the committee chairs, right, to mm -hmm. notify them. So we would notify the committee chairs and the various parties of the designations. Uh, you made uh, some changes today from what you sent out a, couple, a few weeks ago. Only one change. Mm. Then there's so. a typo, Michael. No. So I think, uh, oh, this is the wrong list. I did it again. This is the old list. This is the 2016-2017. I'm, maybe I updated the wrong one. My bad. Oh, there's one in the oh, packet. I'm looking at it right now. 
I, I'm looking at one that says 2016 to 2017 that's in the packet. This is the this one that was in the packet. 13 in the, uh, packet. So yeah, I updated the wrong one. Oh. Well, the yeah, that's the wrong one. Oh, that's the right one. Yeah. Now you have something different in my packet. So, so, so if you go, oh, good. okay, I see it. Just use the one in the packet, not the one that's. Um so th there are two, for the record, Mr. Chairman. One yes. is in the packet that was scanned on Thursday, and the second yeah. was added today when forwarded to us <laughs> by yourself. So number 13, where it says placeholder. So which one are we supposed to be looking at? Now? The one in the packet. It says my apologies, no. Mr. Masseri. Uh, I was just looking at the one that uh, you're, 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 uh, I think it's in this one here. I your preliminary file uh, that you sent out maybe yeah, a month ago. Yeah. That was oh, the 2016-17. Yeah, okay. You, you oh, okay. put Jump some proposed down. changes in there. Nope. Yeah, because Mr. Schultz has added to it. I sent out the 2016 and 17 liaison assignments as we've done in the past and said, look this over. Let, send me an email with anything that you would, anybody would like anything in particular. Let me know. That was 16 and 17. I will then take your feedback and create a 1718 file. I only heard back from one board member. I took that feedback. I made a 2017 file, which is in your meeting packet. And I was supposed to update line item 13 to say Merrimack Valley Regional Transportation Authority with my name on it. <coughs> and I mistakenly put it in the 2016 and 17 one. So this is the correct. Line item 13 will be updated to say Merrimack Valley Regional Transportation Authority. Other than that, nothing has changed. Okay, so the one that I had pulled out of the water had changed uh, from me and Steve on water to On, on 516, here. Michael, you sent us a final draft. This is page 71 of tonight's meeting. No, I, I see this one here, but I'm yep. working off of this one here since up until this afternoon, I guess. What's it say in the top right hand, Steve? This is 2017-18. This is the one that you sent out of 516. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, just for, let's see, for instance, Cable TV Advisory Committee, you had suggested I take that on this year. Now it's not. It is. Oh, you're on there. You're on there. You're looking at the wrong. I, they have the, they, they put up the 2016-17. Go use the one in the meeting packet, Steve. Not the Steve one that's in the list. Page 71 of tonight's meeting packet. Uh, meeting packet. So don't look at the most recent one that was sent up. Correct. Gotcha. It was updated from the wrong, or the wrong version. I, I, wrong, I updated. So, so wrong. the one that's in the packet itself is wrong. No. No, it's correct. correct. One in the it packet. isn't because underwater wastewater. It's you and me. Oh, Bob and Michael. That's the, the one in the pack. The Water Commission, I get Ms. Ari and Mr. O'Leary. You and I were still going to do wastewater together. But you're yeah, you're still wastewater. in wastewater, but water is. Yes, you and I were still going to do there. wastewater. Okay, all right, so that's Water Commission, though. And one of the things we're going to change sure on that, we're going to call it stormwater and, wa and wastewater. But the water is still you and Mr. O'Leary. Well, the way I read it, it doesn't yeah, say that. Be, but yeah, okay. But the, the water wastewater was MWRA, yeah. potentially Waste Greater Lawrence, or whatever it was, Andover, whatever we were talking about. That was always water wastewater. Water right. Commission is okay. USDA. Yeah, but the water right. commission is different than then, yeah, what well, we're working Well, okay. On. The wastewater's up here. Yeah. <laughs> we can change it. Yeah. I have no problem. Yeah. No, see, it says wastewater. Yeah. I mean, that water. It says I, water yeah, slash I, I wouldn't mind. Wastewater. There's that water. was all the commission. Is one. They may okay. be connected, too. So connected anyway. Uh, I have <laughs> no problem making that change. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't know whether you were making a change or just. I will make the change. Okay. Uh, Mr. O'Leary will replace me on that. But I do have a concern about it. I do. What's that? On the wastewater. And I, you know, I will make the change, but there's been a lot of work on that, and I, you know, I want to make sure we continue to keep moving forward on it. I don't want to see it 
fall by the wayside. I don't want to let Andover derail any of the work that we're doing. I I've done a lot I of work with MWRA. I don't, I don't believe that's going to occur. But anyway, I, I, we're on the same page. I've done a lot of work with we're MWRA on, the on this, and I'm willing to turn it all over to you guys, and you can do it. But there's a lot going on mm -hmm. that... Um, now, Michael, I think in our next conversation about this on the board, we can have a list of the pros and cons of both approaches. You know, the key key items that the board has to take in it consideration, I which would we'll consider the timing on the wastewater, uh, would be the schedule and the, the actual cost in terms of capital and then also the long range cost that could be updated on the schedule that Mark put together. Yeah. So that we can look at everything and say, right. okay. Okay, but and I that would include confused. that would include the length and, and the terms associated with it and everything else. That's not my concern, Mr. Ms. Harry. My concern okay. is the work that we're doing down on Concord Street right now. I'm going to turn that over to you guys. You're no, not no, I understood that. that. that I'm talking about the, the whole thing. I wasn't talking about just But I am. Concord Street. That's what this, this is what okay. this discussion is all about. That's right. Okay? Yep, okay. I have okay. some concerns about it. No problem. Okay. I apologize for it not being as clear because I did make a, a quick little mistake rushing around today to try to get this updated. I updated the wrong file for line item 13. Other than that, nothing has changed. It is exactly what I sent you. So I will make that other update. I will remove my name from waste water, wastewater, and I will add Mr. O'Larian. Yes, Mrs. Minnipelli. But the bringing sewer in through Concord is something we're all yes. in agreement on. So the Andover discussions shouldn't have an impact on that. We need to do that. So why would Which, you right? But there's work being done, yeah. and I've been working with we the consultants. That. So why would that? And I'm happen? going to turn that. They yeah. they're asking to take that all over. Oh. They want to do the Andover MWRA. Oh, you, you mean there's a lot right? of work involved? Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. A lot of moving parts. Yep. Yeah, and it's clearly understood. If, if and I don't want to see it get caught up in the weeds. What you guys focus on the water, I think that's where your attention needs yeah. to be. No, no, Not but at all. If, if you can. Yeah, well, obviously, if you're going down a path and, you, and you're making a decision on Andover for whatever reason, and now we're relying on the MWRE to help us with the sewer on Concord, it could have a negative impact. All of that has to be taken into consideration. This part of that's why I was saying, Michael, by putting up all the pros and the cons of everything that are real critical, that tie in with costs, with schedule with risk associated with getting this done or that done, I think then we're in a position to make a, a decision. And some of it, you're right, we'll I don't turn it to political. We can just, just agree on this one, Mr. Ms. Harry. We'll do it, we'll do, I'll, I will accept the request, and that's fine. Ms. With respect to the ultimate question, I am fine with my personal assignments. Thank you. No issues. Any other issues? No. So I'll make that. Just, look, uh, just the, uh, yeah, my only uh, concern, again, is, is was the Board of Appeals. Again, I just, um, uh, I know you're looking to make the change, and, and that's fine. But it's, I, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, there's no preconceived notions about the board, the board members, or anything else, because there's been issues in the past, you know, publicly stated. And, um, and even Andrew, when you of the Chamber of Commerce, you came in and you were, you were critical. Mm -hmm. You know, I just hope that there's, there's open-mindedness and uh, willing there to listen and willing to learn and yeah. um, understand how the process uh, truly works. And, and again, these people have been uh, long-serving members and served us well and uh, kept us out of a lot of court cases uh, over the years. Uh, they're very, very knowledgeable. So. Uh, well, my decision wasn't based on any personal issue at all. I, I, it was just purely based on experience and just maybe making a few little changes and it has nothing to do with anything personal. Yeah, I, I, we didn't have any you know, discussion about it, which is fine, but I just want to be sure that uh, we all have to, the don't, don't, in don't go in with any preconceived it. notions and, uh, and uh, you have some good people no, there, anything, good long-term Anything, anything people we do, there. we all do what we think is best for the town, so yeah. keep it on mind and everything. And that. Any other? Uh, just one other thing is, as far as, I guess, that back on the Cable Advisory Committee thing again, uh, that I thought it was awful. Uh, 
I would appreciate it if Mr. Masseri is willing to have two liaisons because of the IT aspect of it. He's far more um, in tune. So just put the two of us on that. And that way we can or collaborate. You and I already talked about that. Yeah. Okay. I, that way there, there's some, when they get notified, they know that there's two of us. And again, he has far more expertise and uh, knowledge in relation they to may that. It take two of us to get those both contracts done. So Right. <laughs> so. I think you have a good. Um, Okay. Mrs. Reddington's on that on the committee, and uh, who's that? Mrs. Reddington, um, who's done a, uh, an incredible amount of work with the contracts, contract review, yes, uh, the, pulling uh, everything together yeah, for yeah. the committee, and uh, she's a good, definitely. I mean, they're all good committee yeah, members, we, but she's an attorney, so she has a good wealth of knowledge with all the research and. Uh, Review that she's done. Okay. To get those two poles removed. So I'm going to have three <laughs> updates. I have the cable advisory committee, so. MVRTA, wastewater, water, and is there anything else? Okay, I will get that updated this week. Get it out to everyone, including the town administrator, to post and notify all the chair people associated with yeah. each one of those and, uh, Andrew, uh, Kat, uh, Karen has then taken, once they get finalized, direct information of who the chairs and all the members are of each of these committees, and it's also in the uh, uh, drop box. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next is the review legal bills. And I believe there's a motion. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for April 2017 in the amount of $7,195.82 as follows. Kopelman and Page for general, uh, 3804.29. Kopelman and Page for labor, uh, $1,295. Kopelman and Page uh, for J.T. Berry, $185. Thompson West Publishing, $219. And Coppola and Coppola, $1,692.53 for a total of $7,195.82. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Minipelli. Any discussion? Just Capola and Capola. What would we um, what they have to do? The sale of Town and Land on Acres Boulevard, authorized by the board oh, okay. roughly six weeks ago. Great. Any more questions? I had the same question. Thank so you for So we transfer the property? Uh, I believe that we way? closed on the transaction. They, they, the they transaction? were here to sign uh, roughly two weeks ago, and I, I would imagine yeah. it's been on record now. Congratulations, everybody. We've got something back on the tax rolls. Amazing. <laughs> 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 Where are we with the well, school stuff? Are we Have we done with that one? The transfer on the land with the folks in the Park Street and... No, no. Gil, no, no, we're good. We're, we're not. We're still... Uh, <laughs> but that, it's going to be hot top shortly. Yeah, but it yeah, will be, will be, be hot top <laughs> shortly, but it's, yeah, it's. Oh, okay. Any timeline? This um, year? I would say probably by, by the October town meeting. Okay. And did we vote? No, we haven't voted yet. We have not voted. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And old and new business. I'm all set. Oh, town administrator well, report. Did I miss it? I did. Town administrator's <laughs> report. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've had, I have to apologize. I've had four, four hours sleep in the last two days, so forgive no, me. No Next problem, meeting, Mr. I'll Chairman. be a lot more rested. A few things to note. First, DPW was able to acquire surplus Jersey barriers from MassDOT at no charge to the town. These items were made available to multiple communities, and North Reading was successful in obtaining them. I want to thank Mr. Fodi for making us aware of the availability of these items. Second, attached, please find the formal notification of the town's desire to join MVRTA. town was accepted on J Thursday, June 1st. We will be working with MVRTA and our community compact funded consultant to establish paratransit services for the elderly and disabled later this year. Third, the health department is offering a community public health presentation on mosquitoes and ticks. 
this week on Thursday, June 22nd at 7 o'clock p.m. here in Town Hall. Information was in the report and is available on the town website. Anything to deal with chipmunks? Good. More chipmunks this year than ticks, I think. Uh, that may be an opportunity to bring that up uh, for, <laughs> for a question. <laughs> no, I didn't come to you. It's just uh, unbelievable. We have squirrels. We have squirrels. That's my, yeah. my <laughs> wife's fault. So. <laughs> Uh, fourth, the Community Planning Commission is hosting an affordable housing plan um, forum on June 27th at 7 o'clock p.m. here in Town Hall. I attached information to the report, and there is information up on the town website. Fifth, seasonal water use restric restrictions are in effect and are as follows. Outdoor watering is restricted to the hours between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. and is further restricted to an odd even watering schedule. No outdoor watering is allowed on Monday. Compliance with the stage zero restrictions will help avoid the need for more stringent water use restrictions later in the summer. We'll be frequently reminding the public of the seasonal water use restrictions in place and monitoring the water system's performance. As you know, historically, the system can destabilize quickly, and we ask the board to be aware of the potential need for a special meeting to enact further restrictions. Most importantly, the owners of property with automatic irrigation systems are reminded to calibrate their systems in accordance with these restrictions. And that uh, concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Minipelli, you want to lead us off tonight? Sure. I, I just have a question, and I've raised this a couple of times. Traffic light on between Central and Park. How do, how do we make that happen? It's such a dangerous intersection. And people are barreling up Park. It's really, someone's going to get hurt there. There's people that cross walking pedestrians to Ipswich River Park. There's cyclists there. But there was a house that got plowed into by a, a truck because of someone not stopping. How do we make that happen? Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> who, who, who? Through, through you, Mr. Chairman, I asked the department to generate a capital request on this particular project for the fiscal year 2018 capital improvement plan, which they did. Uh, and it was a design request to proceed with a preliminary design and some feasibility analysis for signalization of multiple intersections, including Central at Park Streets. And for a variety of reasons, one of which was that there did not seem to be a significant desire to pursue the project. The project was not advanced through the planning process. It was not recommended for funding. So I, I think that the first thing, so well, let me also add that as a result of that outcome of the capital process, I've asked the police department to, look, to work with DPW to see if there are any further uh, pedestrian type improvements that can be made there to address the issues of pedestrians crossing Park Street to access the public park that's located on the stretch of Central Street between Park and Chestnut. Um, there may be options that are out there, but I think the primary thing we need to determine is if that is in fact a priority for us to, to attempt to further regulate that intersection beyond the pedestrian improvements, it's a d decision that we're going to need to make because when the discussion has come up, it does not appear that there's been consensus to try to do such improvements at that intersection. I, I just don't want to wait till someone gets really seriously harmed there car accident or cyclist accident or pedestrian accident well, we before we have some kind of a record of uh, accidents and issues over there right i mean there have oh, been there have been issues and, and there are sight, sight line issues that are mm -hmm. there there yeah. was a yes. you know a vehicle into a home last summer that we all saw yeah. um, that generated the attention and it helped contribute mm -hmm. to the request being made um, you know I, I think that we'll continue to put it out there as a potential project but it, it needs it's something that's going to need to garner additional support. So goes the capital. Capital. C capital and, and I don't want to blame the capital committee. I, I think it was it wasn't as much as it wasn't a priority as it, it was it was unclear in the discussions, not necessarily among the capital committee, but that outside the capital committee how much support there was for such a project. Mm -hmm. Because as I understand it there are varying opinions about it. Yes, yeah, sure. The need. People don't and like to have to stop and exactly. people would rather have to and they probably have to be synced with some of the other lights that Yes. Dart through the intersection, and you know. I'm opposed to a whole set of lights there. I'm not opposed to some sort of a signalization to allow pedestrians, a light, a light you know, pedestrians to, to get pedestrian across. light safely. type. Thing, but a yeah. regular set of lights there it takes you. No, but anyway, that's my opinion. I I used to work earlier in my career in Hopkinton, and I could drive from my house to Hopkinton without seeing a red light. <laughs> 
Those are the good old days. Yes, Kate. Yeah. Next. I just wanted, the other thing I wanted to say was um, my son's soccer team, the North Reading Youth Soccer, fifth and sixth grade is the fourth. I'm very proud of them. They went all the way this year to the tournament. They made it. They played uh, a season of all wins and got to the tournament <laughs> and played in the downpour on Friday, played two games on Saturday, and, and they got all the way to the final game against Linfield, and um, they, they came in second for that game. But I just want to say um, thank you to the coaches of that team, uh, Rick McBain and Matthew Laverdia. They carried them through. The, you see a lot of sportsmanship evolve in these kids and um, a lot of teamwork evolve in these kids. And I just wanted to say great, great season, great job, great coaching, fun for the parents, and, and uh, they did an excellent job. And uh, good, good for the force. And also the Diamondbacks, I think they, the, um, Right, the baseball team, our, bi our kids played, they went to New York, the baseball oh, yeah, yes. team, and they yep. did quite well yep. too. I think they won. So congratulations to them too. Uh -huh. Good job. Cool. Kerry Reddington's son, he, AJ's on that team, and I think uh, Representative Brad Jones' son plays on that team as well. So good, good representation yeah. in the sports arena yeah, from North Reading. And, uh, Thank you. That's it. I want to thank the North Reading uh, Police Patrolman's Association for recruiting me to flip burgers with them at their police day. <laughs> a couple of Saturdays ago, it was fun hanging out with those guys. And I'm very proud of our town for our first ever town day. We had over 90 vendors. Um, the weather committee didn't totally cooperate because it was about 95 degrees out, but it was a little bit of a breeze, so it was okay. Now, I want to thank the whole town that came out, and um, we'll make it bigger and better next year. Anything else? I'm okay. Here you go. All set. Okay, I have a couple things. Uh, Sending congratulations to all the 2018 graduates at the high school. Uh, Jane's daughter graduated. My daughter graduated. It was a wonderful evening, so congratulations to all the graduates and wish them best in their college or whatever they're doing after high school. I uh, want to wish the board members a happy 4th of July to you and your families. Enjoy it. Is there something planned for this year's 4th of July? or? What's that? I haven't heard of it. We have not heard any official report from the, from the committee, but uh, <laughs> okay. I'm not aware of anything. And then um, schedule-wise for the town hall over 4th of July, where it being on a Tuesday, is there anything? Town hall will be open on Monday the 3rd and be closed on Tuesday the 4th, reopen Monday, on Wednesday the, the 5th. And trash on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Trash will be collected on Wednesday of that week. That's correct. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, this is the time where this yes, Mr. Mysteri. I uh, one thing I wanted to ask if we were going to go casual. That was the next thing did. on my my <laughs> list. I was just about oh, to say. Um, oh, I know This that, is the yeah. time of year where we go to summer dress code, starting yeah. the next meeting, which is going to be Until after July twenty fourth. So uh, I I have it down here, okay. and then I also wanted to mention town day. I was a it was great, yeah. uh, good turnout, not a great turnout. The heat was heat hurt us. And uh, I think there's some definite lessons learned from it. I assume they will do it again. But we do have National Night Ale coming up, and that's going to be a lot of fun. It's August. August 4th, I believe. August, right? Yeah. Yep. First, I First, first. And uh, I'll be fl flipping burgers there for my fourth year in a row. I'm looking forward to it. And that's all I have. Just reiterate uh, Rita's message, too, about uh, 20th anniversary. Of yes. Yeah. And that's Next from Wednesday. 5 to 8 Wednesday. on Wednesday. That's the opening that's of their this coming Wednesday. Yeah. This coming this Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Down at Ipsa River Park at the gazebo. And I hope the community comes out and shows them the appreciation. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years. But 20 years. It's, first, it's the first committee I joined when I got involved in town government. And it was a pleasure. I enjoyed meeting every one of them. It was a joy to work with. So. Anything else? 24th, don't forget, it's the only meeting for July. But if you have any updates and we need to meet in advance of that, we'll let you know. I think the board members should be prepared. That, uh, we may have to have an emergency meeting or try to schedule it within the 48 hour timeline, okay? Ask everyone to be flexible. Thank you for your time. I know you guys are making a lot of time commitments on this, and I don't want you to 
my tone to be taken as uh, disrespect to your time. I think we have some of the same frustrations. We have the same frustrations, same concerns. They've been expressed to Andover. They appreciate it and um, just said, yeah, that was the past. This is now, and let's see if we can talk. We said, fine. Oh. I'm from but Wisconsin. Show me. We have a motion to go, we have to go back into executive session? Yes. So I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to move back into executive session for exemption three. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Aye. Mr. Aye. 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 Aye.